All right, if I can call this meeting to order and ask you all to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm going to ask you to stay standing for a minute. First, uh, to uh, keep in our thoughts and prayers uh, the victims of the Newtown shooting. And second, to keep in your thoughts and prayers, one of our own, uh, John Howard, who passed away. John was a, a longtime uh, active citizen in our town uh, and also the husband of uh, Kathleen Howard, who served uh, on this board of select. Thank you. First item on the agenda. I gather everybody's here for this one. The approval of the minutes. May I have a motion to uh, accept? So moved. A second? Second. Any discussion? No. You ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Next up, Fairfielder and Employee of the Year Awards. Uh, this is the ninth year that we've been doing the special recognition. I want to thank everybody who sent in nominations uh, in each category and s specifically thank the two committees that reviewed the recommendations. For Fairfield of the Year Committee, Judge of Probate Dan Caruso, uh, local businessman Harvey Sussman, and former uh, selectman Kathleen Howard. On the Employee of the Year Award, uh, Credit Union CEO Ed Crowley, uh, Town Treasurer Helen Devonzo, and Deputy Chief of Staff Jennifer Carpenter. Uh, for, uh, I guess to kick things off, let's take Employee of the Year Award first. Uh, the basic. What? I'm not sure if he's here. He's, he's in the hallway. Is he out there? Is he not here? I think he's in the hallway. I think. Is he how, do we, uh, how do we find that out? Is he here? Very close. He'll be here. Okay. He's close. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to cover the criteria in a minute, but um, timeless is not on the list. Okay. On the other hand, we know he's not speeding. <laughs> All right, uh, as I was saying, uh, the criteria for employment employee of the year cover performance excellence, reliability and dependability, initiative, integrity, judgment, cooperation and spirit, outstanding public service, and unique contributions to improve government services. This year's winner is Chief Gary McNamara. And Chief, if, if I could ask you to take a position at the podium while uh, I recognize a few items here. And uh, I would also like to ask um, uh, Deb Greenwood, uh, CEO of the Center for Women and Families, to also join us since she nominated uh, the chief for this position. Surprise. <laughs> and uh, just to cover a few highlights of what was a <clears throat> rather lengthy nomination, uh, we talk about the motto or mission of our police department is being to pr protect and to serve. Uh, our police department in Fairfield, Connecticut does more than protect and serve, they prevent. And I'm reading Deb's words, by the way, just so we're... Uh, under the leadership of Chief Gary McNamara, the police department has proven to be an invaluable partner in the efforts, efforts to prevent domestic and sexual violence in our community. While typical law enforcement is engaged after the violence has occurred, 
the women and men serving our community are actively engaged in preventing the violence from taking place at all. Um, she goes on to point out that, uh, that with a focus on prevention and safety, Chief McNamara supports his detectives and officers in training, the Fair, in training uh, Fairfield as well as other police departments on the response to and handling of domestic and sexual violence cases. The trauma and complexity of the relationships and needs in these cases call for an educated and informed interactions. Um, she goes on to say the chief was instrumental in working with the center and the first elections office to open up the center's Fairfield satellite office in October 2010 at the Fairfield Senior Center. Through a series of focus groups and meetings with community leaders, it was determined that one of the greatest barriers for Fairfield citizens in reaching out for domestic and sexual violence services was the location in another town in, next door in the city of Bridgeport. And she goes on, that the chief has shown his leadership in engaging men in this cause, that Chief McNamara has spearheaded this initially locally, and then one of the primary players statewide. Um, as the following indicates, he was honored by the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence as one of the first 100 men in Connecticut actively engaging other men in the region not to condone violence against women. He's a long-term member and current chairperson of the center's White Ribbon Campaign working to secure 1,000 men boys to become advocates against violence. He co-chairs the statewide initiative with CEO Deborah Greenwood at the Center for Engaging Men and Boys throughout the state and formulating a strategic plan of the best practices that will drive statewide pre prevention program related to domestic violence. He's actively involved for three years in hosting and providing the involvement from the police department for the Fairfield Domestic Violence Vigil for res residents in our town to honor and remember victims of domestic violence, and he chaired the statewide program held in April 2012. Uh, this sy symposium, in collaboration with the Center for Women and Families, coordinated 85 police chiefs and local <laughs> state representatives on engaging men initiative to break the Center for Domes Domestic Violence. Uh, those are just some of the highlights. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to offer Deb a chance to uh, expand on that, if you'd like. From First Selectman Tetro uh, is just the highlights. Um, I think today makes it even more special that we're recognizing Chief McNamara given what's happened and transpired. Um, my daughter and son in law and, and grandchildren live in the town of Fairfield, and I know how safe and how wonderful this town is because of the police department, and it starts at the top. It starts with everyone that serves on the Fairfield Police Department. What happened through Hurricane Sandy, how he led this town to where it is today, in addition to what's happening at a statewide level to stop violence and prevent it before it happens in all areas, is to be recognized. And I'm so glad that you yes. were chosen. Um, we become partners, and we're going to stay hooked arms in arm throughout the state to make this become a reality. And my closing words are, we have a big walkathon that will be happening. It's, it's not a moneymaker, it's an awareness that will be happening here in Fairfield. It's called Walk a Mile in Her Shoes. It will be the first one. And this is being led by our White Ribbon Initiative through Chief McNamara's leadership. But we made this shirt up for Chief because the words just say it. Strength, bravery, confident, and the purple ribbon is against violence against anyone. Men, women, children, elder abuse fitting for a man like Chief Gary McNamara. Thank, Thank you for very, your work. Very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chief, would you like to offer a vote? Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, one of the first meetings, Mike, that you uh, brought all of us together in, you struck me as an individual who would like to start meetings on time. This is one of the rare times that I'm late for a meeting, so I apologize for that. Uh, I'd like to, um, first of all, I think whoever was on the committee got it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, because it's, it's not about me as an employee in the town of Fairfield, it's about the employees in the town of Fairfield. And, you know, I work with a group of men and women that I've mm -hmm. never, I've been here 25 years, I've never worked with a group of men and women in the Fairfield Police Department that are that are uh, performing at all cylinders right now, and I mean that wholeheartedly. Uh, from the um, 
we've been challenged over the last several years with some unique circumstances, not only in our community, but in the region. From the first uh, hurricane, which the first selectman said in on all our meetings, to the, to the plans made, and, and now the second hurricane that challenged us even more, uh, we can't do what we do without the men and women that work for us. So you got it all wrong, because I'm not the employee of the year. It's those employees that are making us look good that are the employees of the year. And I'm very fortunate to work with them, those men and women, not only in the, in, the, in the police department, but also in the town government, in the Department of Public Works, the Health Department, the Building Department, the Fire Department, and I can go on and on, Board of Education, right on down the line. Uh, and now we find ourselves on the cusp of a significant tragedy that affected the state and the town of Newtown. And I'm watching the men and women of the Fairfield Police Department um, responding to that incident and handling situations that this town has no idea what they're doing. And I'm proud of them, and I'm proud uh, to be an employee in this town. I just left an, an officer, that's why I'm late, who delivered a teddy bear to a student that was in Sandy Hook Elementary School at the time of the shooting. And one of our officers was there with him after the shooting, moments after the shooting, and went so far as to recover his teddy bear to bring it back to him, because he wanted it. So that's the kind of employees that I work for. I mean, I work for them. That's what makes me look good, and frankly, I couldn't do what they do. So the most significant part of this is, uh, is the fact that I'm a Town of Fairfield employee. And that's what makes me very proud. I'm very proud to be a, an employee in this town. I'm proud to be supervising a group of men and women and working amongst great leaders in this town <coughs> to handle crisis. And, and, I, and I have a tendency to go on and on, but I will end by this by saying, day in and day out, 24 hours a day, there are men and women, employees in this town, that are working and preparing for the things that make the news. So the events that we see in the Sandy and hurricanes and things, that's going on day to day, not only amongst us, but also amongst all the employees. So I am humbled by, by being recognized for it, but it's not my recognition, it's the recognition of those people that, that work for me. So thank you very much, and uh, I apologize for being early. And Chief, before you leave, <laughs> uh, I think that the board may wish to, to uh, chime in a bit with some comments. Kristen, did you? Uh, we can all tell why he was given this award today and it is as Deb said so timely and even more powerful um, today given what you have done um, even in the past few days so I just wanted to share a quote the courage of life is often a less dramatic spectacle than the courage of a final moment but it life is no less a magnificent mixture of triumph and tragedy. Chief McNamara, your example, your compassion, your leadership is a triumph and it is a strength and I thought that was a great word um, that we all uh, hold on to and we appreciate so much what you have done and how you conduct yourself and your words today even in, in sharing what you shared are so powerful so thank you very very much Kim, you well, want to add something? Chief McNamara I just want to say thank you um, I've come to know you over the years and every interaction with you has been professional and polite and you've always put the town first your team first your team members that you've already <laughs> quoted a couple times um, they work their work is a reflection of you your dedication your strength and your courage and your desire to make Fairfield the safest community possible. And we all thank you very much. I guess echoing uh, both my colleagues, uh, I would add it that uh, uh, the chief and I have had a chance to work in, in a number of these events over time. I've continually been impressed uh, with his thought process, uh, how he looks to not only solve problems, but avoid problems. Uh, I think it, it, he always looks for what our residents need, how they will react, how they will take it, and what we do is how we do it. What's do what's best for our residents in in stepping through that. So I, I could go on for a long time with a host of examples. Uh, I guess the simplest way to say it um, is that we all need examples. Uh, 
and, and looking to uh, the chief. He's one of the examples I use in terms of how to lead, uh, how to manage these situations, and I learn a lot from him each time we get together. So thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have our Fairfielder of the Year. The criteria for this award include outstanding volunteer commitment that benefits an individual, group, or the entire community of Fairfield, unique achievement that benefits our community or so society in general, model citizen who reflects the positive values of the town of Fairfield, and exceptional leadership personal qualities, including leadership, initiative, reliability and dependability, integrity, and cooperation and spirit. <clears throat> this year's winner is Dr. George Lacavera. I'd like to call up the Lacavera family to accept this award on his behalf. Is there a representative here? <laughs> as, as, as many that come, and I'd also like to uh, ask uh, Janet Kanapa of the Director of Alumni Re Relations at Fearful U to come up and uh, give us a few highlights. <clears throat> Stand at the podium. And, uh, Thank you for selecting us for the opportunity to join in this, this celebration. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Janet Canova, and I'm a proud resident of the town of Fairfield. And I work at Fairfield University as the director of alumni relations. In light of all the goings on in the world, and most recently the tra tragic events so close to home in Newtown, Connecticut, I cannot think of a better individual to hold up as an example, a role model and an inspiration for goodness in this world. <clears throat> As we say, those of us that are Jesuit educated, a man for others, and that is none other than our friend, Dr. George Lacavera. It is my honor to read this nomination that Father Charles Allen, chaplain to the emergency services of the town of Fairfield, and university and alumni chaplain of Fairfield University, and I submitted on behalf of our dear friend and colleague, Dr. George Lacavera. Born in the town of Fairfield, Dr. George Lacavera attended Fairfield Prep and then graduated from Fairfield University in 1956. After leaving Fairfield University, he continued his education at Columbia University Dental School, where he received his doctorate in dental surgery. After graduating from dental school, he served in the United States Air Force and then returned to Fairfield both to live and to practice dentistry as a member of the Fairfield Dental Association until his retirement. He married Joan Crowley from Milford, Connecticut in 1960. They have four children, George, Paul, Alicia, and Diane, one of whom would go on to graduate from Fairfield University. Professionally, George received the Columbia University School of Dentistry Outstanding Alumnus Award in 1984, and in 1992, he received the Bridgeport Dental Association Dentist of the Year Award. He was president of the Bridgeport Dental Association and the Connecticut Dental Association. 
and his alma mater, Fairfield University, Dr. Lacavera has been a longtime member of the President's Circle and served as the President of the Alumni Association from 2006 to 2008 and has been an active member on numerous, numerous university and alumni committees and events. Over the years, Dr. Lacavera was Chairman of the Town of Fairfield Board of Health, served as a member of the Town of Fairfield Police Commission and later as the Commissioner. He was a director of the Fairfield Chamber of Commerce, a member of the Fairfield Ethics Commission. He was a member of the Kiwanis and served as its president. He's a Eucharistic minister in St. Pius Parish. Additionally, in 2001, he received the Fairfield Chamber of Commerce Harold Harris Leadership Award. In 2002, he received the Connecticut Secretary of State Public Service Award and received the Jerry Malafronte Community Service Award from the Town of Fairfield Republican Party. In hundreds of different ways, Dr. George Lacavera has served the people of the town of Fairfield. Truly a man of faith, family, friends, and all things Fairfield. Congratulations to George Lacavera and to his family, Fairfielder of the Year. Again, if I can, uh, would uh, anyone like to add uh, any comments to this? Please go ahead, ma'am. Yes, and though I do not know your wonderful husband personally, I am so inspired by, again, the triumph of his life and his prolonged generosity and selflessness. It is amazing, and I'm very, very happy to see you all thank here, and you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lockefeller, is a wonderful man. He has served our community for, for decades on various committees and boards and other levels of volunteerism well beyond the list that we've already heard. You've heard about the ones that we know about. You haven't always heard about the little ones helping the neighbor, doing this for a person, helping a friend in need. A wonderful man, a leader, a great Fairfielder, and very well deserving of this award today. Thank you. Very well. I got to know George when I came back to Fairfield and got involved with the Qantas Club, and we worked together there and had lunch every Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he, was, he was one of the great examples in that club of community service and what's, what makes Fairfield special. It's that spirit of volunteerism, that, that uh, giving back. And I think that George, no, in no small way, uh, was a leader by example in that and, and, and an example for all of us to live up to. Um, so thank you for sharing with us. and, and uh, we. And uh, we do. Okay. And if uh, we can present this to Representative on George's behalf. <laughs> We're going to take a quick uh, one-minute resource before moving on with the rest of the agenda. Thank you, Kevin. All right, our break is over. We're back in session. Uh, thank you very much. Next up, we have some uh, item five, some resignations. Um, these are for information only. Uh, Henry Backey uh, from the Historic District Commission, also Tom Daly from the Historic District Commission, and Adam Cliver from the... the Historic District Commission. Uh, reappointments. 
Uh, we have to here consider and act upon the following reappointment to the Greater Bridgeport Transit Authority, uh, Seraphim, also known as Sam Kudis, Republican, 2979 Burr Street, for a term of 1112 through November 16. May I have a motion to accept? So moved. A second. Second. All right. Any discussion? I'll just quickly thank Sam for his continued service to our town. You're always a pleasure to work with, and we really appreciate all your hard work and dedication. So thank you, sir. Any words? And a thank you as well uh, for me, for your willingness to serve. The, the transit district uh, is important, and, and paying attention to the issues of getting more cars off the street is close to my heart. So I'm very grateful for your service. Yeah. Uh, Sam and I go back to Kiwanis also. And, and Sam has been involved in the town and serving our community as a volunteer uh, for a number of years now. And I want to thank you again for your service and for your continued service here. Um, any further comments? No. Any comments from the public? Uh, back to the board. Are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations, Sam. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> Would you uh, care to offer any words to the group? consider and act upon the following appointments. Uh, do you want to take these one at a time or is it good? Good preference. Good. 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 Okay. Yes. All right, the following appointments for the Historic District Commission. Uh, Thomas Daly, Democrat, 10 Southport Woods Drive, uh, November 12 through November 17. He's replacing Margaret uh, Kufferman, whose term expired. Adam Cliver, Republican, 280 Hillside Road, from a term 1109 to 1114, to replace Henry Backey, who resigned. And lastly, Margaret Kufferman, uh, unaffiliated, uh, 877 uh, Westport Turnpike, for a term of November 11 through November 16th, as an alternate to replace Adam Cliver, who moved to a full member. Uh, may I have a motion to accept? So moved. All in favor? Uh, second. Second. All right. Any discussion? Again, thank you to those of you who have been serving, and I know it's a, some moving around um, for folks, and it sounds like it makes sense, and I am grateful for your service as the town is as well. So thank you. Thank you for your service and your continued service on the Historical Society Commission, um, helping to preserve our town as it once was, and we do appreciate your efforts. Yeah. I think that, that one of the valuable parts of Fairfield is our heritage going back and, and uh, the Historic District Commission is one of the groups that keeps that heritage alive and well from generation to generation. So thank you for uh, protecting who we are and uh, where we've come from and all of that. And again, thank you for your volunteerism. Are we ready to vote? Any uh, comments from the public? Are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Congratulations to all three. And I would ask uh, if either, any of you would like a comment to, uh, a moment to comment to the public. Just very quickly. If you could, uh, I'm sorry, I from the, uh, we need to capture you for, for the, all the residents at home that are tuned in. <clears throat> sorry, I thought I could do this very quickly. I just wanted to thank the uh, Board of Selectmen for uh, continued confidence, and I'm sure that I uh, share the views of my fellow members. And I also wanted to thank our chair, who's here, uh, Ellen Gould, who does a, uh, super job as uh, the chairman of the Historic District Commission. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next up, we have a banner request uh, to hear, consider, and act upon a request from B Cause Foundation to hang a banner at Sherman Green. May I have a motion to accept? So moved. A second. Second. All right. Uh, discussion. Is there anybody here from B Quest? Do you would mind coming up to the podium, introducing yourself, <laughs> and uh, 
letting us hear your comments. My name is Cindy Citrone. I'm on the advisory board of the Because Foundation, which is a new um, 501 um, profit. C3? C3, sorry, non profit, who did the event at the high school. We do Lego building blocks, um, and our mission is to help local children in the community. Although we're doing the event at the Discovery Museum, um, the builder and the builders that will be participating are all um, children from Fairfield, as well as um, what they did. If we've taken the best of the best projects and we're moving them up there. We had about 300 exhibits there, so at the Discovery we're doing that. And then our local master builder, Bill Probert, who's a Fairfield resident, is going to set up a trainscape. We're hoping it will um, help them grab crowds. And I guess they told me 25% of their constituency comes from Fairfield. And we are registered as a foundation, and 90% of our board members are Fairfield citizens. So if the space is available for a non-Fairfield, uh, well, we are a Fairfield organization for a non-Fairfield event, we would ask for your consideration. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, from the board. No. Comments or questions? No questions. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Just if I could, um, you did mention that, that um, did you say all of the, the members of this group or all the participants in this event are from Fairfield? I would say 90%. It's, you okay. know, we're not exclusive to Fairfield, but it's a grassroots organization that we sell in, and that's where the majority are. Yeah. Now, is this the same event that uh, I went to last year that was at Roger Ludlow, or yes, Ludlow at the High, high School? school? Yes, yes. Ludlow Sorry, High Fairfield School. Ludlow High School. Fairfield Ludlow High School. Yes, that is correct. All right. So, so this is the event where they take the children, take bricks and build blocks and models, mm -hmm. and we're doing it with a science theme, and we're hoping that the Discovery Museum, that there'll be more admissions through their gates to help them build sponsorship and supports, and the foundation does support them with grants for Brid Bridgeport inner city scholarships for families. So. Um, and as I remember, there were uh, tremendous participation last year. There were your kids in, in, right, you know, at our high in school the big event, gym and in the small gym. At the big gym, we, we, and thank you for <laughs> your use of that, mainly Fairfield. Um, and this, like I said, was an extension of that. We had such a wonderful outpouring there that we wanted to do something. This will allow the exhibits to go through the weekend and the week even. So rather than setting up one day and taking it down, our kids will be able to build projects, and they'll be building new projects that will go through the weekend. So they were able to let us to do that. So, but we'll still be at the high school <laughs> next year if approved. <laughs> okay, so this is a one-year kind of move, and then you're coming back. No, no, it's year. an additional program. Okay, it's, it's an additional that, that event. happens in November. This is an additional program that we're adding because we'd like to um, continue this group throughout the year rather than a one-year type of thing, which is why we formed this foundation. So it's kids building support for other children. Okay. In Connecticut. So. All right. Careful. Thank based. you. Thanks. Uh, any other comments here? No. Any comments from the public on this event? On this motion? All right. Coming back. Um, you know, when we look at our, our policy, um, it really is focused on items in the, in the town of Fairfield. Uh, the reason we allow it to come before the Board of Selectmen if there are things that, that are appropriate, and we have made exceptions to that from time to time. Right. Um, I guess for what it's worth from my standpoint, I'm looking at this as primarily a Fairfield group, something that has happened in Fairfield in the past. The Discovery Museum is something historically this town has supported. Um, and they're looking at the, the event dates are January 12 through 13, which means the banner would be up in the winter when there's not lots of other uh, okay. banner activity. Right. So it, it <coughs> wouldn't be necessarily taking a space from any other organization that would have that. I agree with all that. I would add, I, I know that a lot of the students at Stratfield Elementary School participated with Mrs. Thomas, one of uh, sure. the teachers there. So there, I know firsthand that there are lots and lots of Fairfield kids and families involved. I think it's worthwhile, and I will be supporting it. All right. Agreed. Any other comments? No. We ready to vote? Yes. We are. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. You have your banner. Thank you. Thank you for your work. All right, next up, uh, to hear an update from the Riverfield School Building Committee. Mr. Quinn, Mr. Dwight, who's going to... Just here for a second. All right. Uh, I'm here as a uh, poor substitute for our superintendent, Dr. David Title. Uh, he would normally be here, but he went home ill uh, this afternoon. He did not want to bring any illness to anybody during the holidays. 
but uh, you are in capable hands. Ms. Iacona, who's our vice chair, has been the liaison to the Riverfield Building Committee. And Ms. Commander Quinn is the chair of it. Tom Cullen is here. So I'm sure you are in capable hands. And you'll see him another day. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for putting us on the agenda. We wanted to give you a, an update of where we stand on the uh, Riverfield uh, renovation project. And uh, today we're going to have uh, some presenters uh, from the uh, Borison Architects, Ken Borison, the principal and owner, uh, George Cattinger. Uh, director of Development, um, and from uh, SBS, uh, we have Mark Skalenka and Sean Sullivan, both of them. They are the program managers. Um, so my role really is at the beginning here to introduce them, take you through a little bit of the history of what we've done, and then uh, turn it over to these wise gentlemen and ladies uh, to take you through the uh, specifics. But we started uh, sometime around March, April as a committee um, and engaged uh, Borenson and Architects in, in August and SBS in September. And we've made some, I think, some remarkable time. Uh, we've gone through uh, tens of iterations, okay? And what you'll see today is the final three that we looked at, that we then did a cost estimate on and a, a litmus test and whether or not it truly uh, met all the upgraded educational specs. And we developed the construction cost for those three options. And then as, as we came out to an answer, we looked at the numbers and we said for the one that the committee really liked, uh, we decided we had to do a value engineering. In parlance, that means a cost reduction. We needed to look at every single element of that plan and then make sure that it was A, that it was justified, B, that it was the right thing to do, and C, that we have the most reasonable estimate going. And we did that and we got down to a plan, which you have seen already, the bottom line being $15 million. And so that is what we did. And now I want to turn it over to Ken to take you through the actual architecture. Good evening. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm going to start with just going over the uh, Riverview education spec upgrades that we were given in order to design the project and just kind of talk about the principal program drivers. It's on the next page. I'm going to summarize a bit of this. Uh, we're going to eliminate portable classrooms and provide pr uh, permanent program space resolve the bus drop-off and uh, parent drop-off site issues, maintain a minimum of 90 spaces. We're going to provide 20, uh, we're going to accommodate future uh, enrollment of 430 to 500 students through 2021. There are going to be 24 classrooms K through uh, 5. Uh, special ed spaces such as resource rooms and language arts rooms, uh, separate computer lab from the library so that can be used more efficiently. There will be a music and art suite. Uh, there will be administrative area improvements, as called out in the ed spec, and uh, support offices, new lockers throughout. The kitchen's going to be upgraded and updated. Hazardous material abatement in the areas that we touch in the building. We're going to have uh, new central air conditioning and sprinklers throughout the facility, and the facility will be fully accessible when we're complete. Now, I have some boards to, and you have these in the uh, in your handouts, but I will go over the actual site plan and floor plans. So this is the, oops, hang on a sec. Heck, I need my tech guy here. Let me turn this on. There you go. So this is the site plan. Here's Mill Plain Road where you enter. So what we're starting with is we're going to widen this parking area and we're going to provide a new bus 
a parent drop-off area around here. Uh, pretty much the bus drop-off stays the same, and then we increase some parking along here. We're maintaining all the existing trees uh, so that it's sustainable. And the basic idea in the, in the site concept is to minimize the impact on the site. We looked at a variety of different uh, schemes, one of which put kind of a bar back in here, but there's areas that's very close to this floodplain, and this, the grade is not well researched here. It could be fill, and uh, this, is the, this is the fourth scheme. Let me start with that. This is the value engineered scheme I'm going to show you. We're going to talk about the other schemes that we also looked at in terms of dollars and compare those. But this is the scheme we ended up with. So in this scheme, there's a revised entrance. Uh, this area here is pretty much the, uh, the uh, service area that's needed to support the school. We've expanded the gym and put a stage on the back of it. And we have a music suite here. And then we have where the, uh, the um, pod was. That comes down, and there's a two-story addition here. The uh, portables that were here are gone then. So again, we're trying to minimize the footprint. It's more sustainable not to spread this thing out all over the place and still maintain as much of the site as we can. And this ends up with 99 parking spaces, uh, six bus drop-off spaces, and 17 car spaces for parent drop-off. Those spaces could also be used at night if there was the parent drop-off spaces, if there was a special event. Uh, sorry, first. So we'll get into the first floor. So here you have, again, this is the entrance. Right now, this is an overhang. We're going to enclose that overhang with uh, a lobby space, area where you could put a security desk if desired. When you go through these doors, these doors are locked, except for when the buses drop off the kids and it's policed. Uh, you then have to go into the office administrative area to check into the school. So that's a security. Uh, area. There's also doors here and doors here. At night, if the community wants to use the gym, they can come in, come back here, use the gym, use the bathrooms, but not get into the rest of the school. So there's, in this area, a conference room, and then these are all the service areas, uh, electrical areas, uh, dedicated storage, uh, fire pump rooms, all the kinds of things you need to support the school. <coughs> Along the back here, this area here is the addition to the gym, again, following the spec to allow a, an all-school assembly. And the, uh, the uh, stage is right behind it. There's a music suite here, so they can go right onto the stage in case they're going to have a uh, performance, uh, a new resource room. The kitchen is uh, essentially renovated, and there's, new, uh, there's a new uh, freezer and storage and uh, refrigerator space across the hall. Uh, the administrative suite is, again, reconfigured with a health clinic next to it to be more efficient. New bathrooms, accessible bathrooms are provided where they're not accessible bathrooms now. In the media center, the computer area gets put into this classroom over here so that the media room can be used uh, better than it is now. This classroom becomes a science classroom. These two classrooms become language arts and uh, math and instructional improvements. And in this new wing at the lower level, you have kindergarten and first grade classrooms with an elevator. On the second floor, essentially, you have your fourth and fifth room uh, grade classrooms and your uh, bathrooms, uh, a resource room, staff bathroom and mechanical spaces. Again, on this first floor, sorry, let me just say that the second grade is here and the third grade is here. So you have kindergarten, first grade, second, third, and then upstairs, fourth and fifth. In terms of the uh, perspective views, this is the existing overhang that's there now. It gets enclosed with glass. Uh, this is the front of the two-story wing. This is a rear view. Again, it's a wide-angle kind of view. So, But here's the two-story addition. There's the original school. And there's the addition with the uh, music suite. And this is actually a view from the neighbor. One of the things that we ended up doing 
is meeting with the neighbors. There was concerns about, you know, what the impact was going to be to expand the gym. And so this is actually taken from one of the neighbor's properties. We have some arborvitaes that we were going to plant, and then they wanted some kind of pattern to <coughs> reduce the blank wall. And again, this is very conceptual. The pattern work will be designed uh, further. I think that's it for the design for the moment. George is going to talk about numbers. No. No? Oh, sorry. Tom, you and I were going to talk about the uh, alternative scheme. So if you turn to the next page, you got the major design alternatives. Yeah, the final analysis after we went through many iterations, uh, we settled on three schemes. Uh, the scheme 2B, which is the top of the page, uh, we had a new wing on the back of the building, uh, which would be added to the pod and a nominal addition to the gym. Uh, we rejected that uh, because of the footprint compromises, the site flexibility, and the higher upkeep costs of that particular uh, uh, theme. Scheme three was to build a new gym in the existing pod area and a two-story two classroom wing where the original gym was located. And that proved to be much too costly of, a, of an option. Again, part of these options that we developed were a lot on the neighbor's input because uh, you know there is a, a concern about what they have to view coming out their backyards in the back of the school. And uh, even though our educational spec was to get more receding in room in the gym to take care of 500 students, uh, you know, to build a gym to compensate for that would be way too big uh, on that particular side. In scheme four, we looked at building the two-story wing where the existing pod is located. And nominally increase, increase the original gym. For a lot of reasons, uh, the committee felt that that was the best alternative, but the cost was not the best in terms of our viewpoint. We looked at that, and that turned out to be $17.1 million for a total project cost. Uh, in, our, in our deliberations, we went back, back to the committee, to the architect, to SPS, and said the maximum that we can do on this particular building was $15 million. Find a way to make it work. And that's what we came up with. And that is what you're going to see now from George on the construction end, okay? Where we saved a total of a million point seven. George? Good evening. Uh, as Tom mentioned, we constructed estimates for these three schemes plus the value engineering concept. And the table on the left here shows the uh, breakdown of how we derive these estimates. Uh, typically on a conceptual ed estimate, it's not unusual to apply square foot costs. But because our drawings that we provided were more advanced, these are actually technical estimates that were derived, which is why we took the trouble to show you the construction divisions. Divisions through to 16 represents the actual work involved to build the building. So we're pretty comfortable with our costs. Uh, then you have below the line numbers where we're adding things like uh, subcontractor bonds, escalation to construction, general conditions, and estimating contingency CM fees and bonds. Uh, and you can see where all the numbers total out on the bottom uh, in our chosen scheme that the committee directed us to, to value engineer was for. So we developed an actual construction cost, an expected construction cost of a million six. Uh, that a million six is folded into the actual project budget, which you see on the next table in your sheet or on the table on the right here, which I'll let Mark address. Sure. Thank you. So working with the design team and the building committee, our task was to take the construction budgets and estimates developed by the design team and incorporate those into an overall project budget. Uh, we know uh, construction makes up typically uh, anywhere from 66% to 75% of the overall project cost. So our task was to take the numbers uh, in the same uh, format of scheme 2B, scheme 3, 4, and develop overall project costs. And you can see 
um, when you take the construction numbers and you add furnitures, fixtures, and equipment, you know, the loose furniture, the equipment that the students would need in the new spaces, uh, the fees and expenses, fees from designers to consultants uh, to lawyers um, to bonding costs, uh, that represents the cost and the fees and expenses. And those are typically percent driven versus fixed fees. So as the construction costs go up or down, those percentages also go up and down. And then we also carry in our budgets typically the, the contingency for the unknowns uh, of, of working on a, uh, a school pro or any project for that matter. So you can see from scheme 2B, uh, originally the overall project budget was $16.7 million, uh, 3 was 17.9, and 4 was 17.1. Following the charge from the building committee, uh, we were tasked to get this down to $15 million. So what most of the effort came out of the construction costs, uh, that was really the heavy uh, value engineering occurred. We did take a few dollars out, out of the uh, FF and Elon item. And then again, the fees and expenses and the contingencies are all percent driven. So as the construction costs came down, the overall project costs came down. So we are here to report that the project as developed by the design team at this point uh, is at a $15 million price tag. Before we go on to the next pages, uh, when we took over as a, as a committee, uh, we were told that uh, a ballpark estimate was performed uh, by a, an outside vendor and it indicated it was an $11 million project. Um, we never used that in our, any of our estimates. We said, you design to the educational specs that you have and that you were given by the Board of Ed. And that's what we designed to. Okay? You need to understand that when that $11 million was fancied about, the educational specs were not on the table. They had not been released. So that, that ballpark estimate was done well before the educational specs were on the table and, in fact, uh, make a big difference in the final number. Okay, George and Mark, you want to review the differences? Uh, essentially, there's a sheet in your folder called Project Budget Category Differentials. Uh, and it attempts to just put your arms around the major differences between the pre-ed spec uh, estimate and, and the scheme four estimate. Uh, and, and principally, and again, uh, the pre-ed spec did not define clearly what was going to be in this building. So you can't criticize the way the number was applied. But the, the pre-ed spec had no abatement costs. So we have that included in ours. The site work allocation was a uh, $60,000 line item just for expanded parking. Uh, within the ed specs, we were asked to really examine all the site work and redevelop what was necessary. So the site work cost turned out to be 1.5. Uh, when you get into the things like a gym floor replacement, uh, because there was no ed spec, there was no line item for that work in the pre-ed, we would replace the gym floor, which is represented by the value. Uh, the total project costs that were carried in the pre-ed estimate, as shown, was 1.4. Uh, Just to add commentary to that, they carried 15 percent for the soft costs, and I mentioned earlier we typically carried 25 to 33 percent. So that was what we felt was a pretty low uh, soft cost percentage markup on the construction estimate that they developed. Right. That scheme. Uh, they didn't have any allocation for construction management fees. So the differentials that you see there are, are pretty extreme and accounts for most of, of uh, the difference between the 11 and the 15. And like we said, it came up to 17, and we were charged to bring it in at a more manageable rate. Total project cost of 15. Uh, on the next page, <coughs> you have a small sheet that gives you the program differentials. Uh, and basically, the column on the left shows what was included in the pre-ed spec studies, and the scheme four column on the right shows you what's in there. Uh, and, and you get to the bottom line, uh, is they were creating an addition of 11,000 square feet in the ed spec and chosen plan that we're working with is putting an addition of 32,000 square feet. Uh, and we're renovating a total of 34,000 feet, which is the balance of the school. And under the other scheme, there's only a small area that was going to be renovated at 1,500 feet. So we, we think that it explains, for the most part, the differentials between the two estimates and comparisons. <coughs> The last thing I just want to bring to your attention is the overall project schedule was depicted on the last sheet in your handout. 
Uh, and this is just a very linear schedule that depicts where we are today and where we plan to go over the next few months and next couple of years. Um, so clearly we're in this December, January time frame where we would be coming in front of the Board of Selectmen, the Board of Finance, um, the RTM between December, January, maybe early February to seek all of the approvals that we would need for the project. Um, we would then uh, further advance the design into what's called schematic design phase uh, for a couple of months, uh, work on our grant application, which would be submitted to the state uh, in May for, uh, for June receipt, continue with uh, design documentation through the summer, uh, early fall, um, look to uh, complete the design early spring of 2014 with uh, review from the Board of Ed and uh, the State uh, Bureau of School Facilities. Um, bid uh, March, of, March, April, May of 2014. Start construction in June of 2014, right after the kids uh, are dismissed. Uh, and a completion of the overall project by July of 2015. So when they come back in September of 2015, we're out of the way and they've got a brand new school to, uh, to use. So that's our thoughts right now on the overall project schedule. One of the key things that we looked at, obviously we have a school that's being used, okay? And you, you can't just shut it down. You can't just move everybody to the next door. Uh, so we looked at all these themes and all these schematics to an eye to what was the best economical way, easiest way, and the most conducive to the educational system to be able to build and keep the kids going to class. And that was scheme four. Okay, scheme four is the one that we're able to move the kids, okay, into uh, portables, okay, and then build their classrooms, get them in the classrooms, and do the rest of the buildings. And, you know, without missing any educational uh, opportunities. The other thing I wanted to leave with the Board of Selectmen, and I know you know this, but it probably bears statement again. Uh, we've gone through a rough year in Fairfield. A very tough year with Sandy, with a lot of surprises, uh, and there's a lot of uh, requests for funding, and we're well aware of that. And one of the reasons we worked hard to get this down to what we consider a manageable number is in response to that. Also the fact that I'm cheap, okay? So uh, that's the other part, part of it. But importantly, I think we need to recognize that no matter what happened this past year, next year will be something else. And the year after that will be something else, okay? Life is nothing but a series of surprises, okay? And you will be facing different opportunities and risks every year. That doesn't mean you can walk away from providing, okay, an increase in the infrastructure of your school system. And this school, by God, needs your help. It was built in 59. It was a, a model, a remodeled a little bit, 72, with its gym, but it needs its help. I had no kids that went here, no vested interest, but I walked through that school, and I was disgraced by what I saw in terms of other schools that I've seen, in McKinley, okay, in Jennings, in you know North Stratfield, in all of them, the Stratfield School, okay? This school needs your support, needs your help. And that's why I'm here, okay? Any questions, we'll be glad to answer or get you the answers. Thank you. Any questions? I have a, a list. I, I just want to begin by thanking the committee. Um, when you set out on this journey, I talked to many, actually all of you, and I want to recognize the time and work that you put in. I'm sure that my colleagues, I won't speak for them, but um, share this, that feeling. So thank you. Um, and to the professionals who are here to support us. Um, and I, Mr. Quinn, I think you, you put it well. Um, certainly $15 million is a lot of money. And all of us um, are thinking about all the, all the stressors that have been put on the town this year, um, both not only financial, but um, just emotional, physical as well. So 
it's very helpful looking at the breakdown. Um, and one of my first costs is act or questions is actually um, related um, to the costs, and just want to make sure I heard correctly. And I think it's um, Mr. Kenninger. Am I saying your name yeah. correctly? You talked about the fact that the drawings are more advanced, so it allowed you to give better, closer estimates. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? What do you mean by the drawings are more advanced? Is it more advanced than they typically would be at this stage? And if so, why? And how does that help you come up with a better estimate? Yes, typically typically a conceptual plan would be just rough floor plans, rough elevations. Uh, we've done, prior to sending this to our estimators, if you look at the drawing packages uh, that were sent out, we have demolition plans. We had engineered survey civil documents which accounted for the drainage and the pavement changes. So uh, we've had the ability to take quantity estimates uh, to develop real world figures. Uh, the contingency that's there and the estimating contingency is to account for the variables that we couldn't put our arms around. Uh, so we have a basis of a firm uh, confidence, I should say, in the numbers that we're generating and that we can de deliver a product for those numbers. It's actually related to contingency, so yeah. all right. Please. So to the contingency piece, that's it was helpful also to see the the, uh, the slide that had the comparison. This one right here, mm -hmm. the pre and stuck and kind of the pre work. One of the things that piqued my interest in the conversation was the difference in the 15 percent for soft costs versus the 25 to 33 um, percent. And just if you could speak to that a little bit, and, and maybe even um, if once you address that, maybe Mr. Moore or Vito or Mr. Cullen could talk about what we've used typically in the past in terms of that percentage and, and why the change there. Sure. Uh, contingency typically in project development, project budget development, uh, in, our, um, uh, in our ideal scenario, accounts for 5% of the construction costs, is, makes up the construction contingency, which is typically there for unforeseen conditions, uh, design deficiencies, uh, changes in the code that may come up during the life of construction. Um, and that's 5% is pretty typical. Um, we also carry typically an owner's project contingency to cover programmatic changes in terms of how the educators are teaching two years from now or uh, betterment uh, that they may want advances in technology, because it doesn't necessarily have to be spent for construction, it could be spent for furniture, it could be spent for signage, it could be spent for lots of, so it's a, it's a fund that's allocated that doesn't have to be spent just because it's there, but from a financial management tool, um, it's wise to have. Um, I think the absolute last thing we want to do is have to come back because we ran out of money. And what we typically do, again, when developing budgets is account for that five and five, which is roughly 10%. Uh, that doesn't mean it has to stay at 10 percent, it doesn't have to be spent, but from a financial management standpoint, we strongly encourage carrying that uh, in your overall project budget. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, and I don't know if the pre ed spec uh, value for project costs had a contingency. If they did, it probably wasn't 10 percent, probably was a lot less. Um, and I don't know how they've spent contingencies in the past. We like to turn projects over with surpluses, not with deficits. We like that too. Yeah. <laughs> just the follow up Go ahead, in please. terms of in the past, if you could just address he, that. He's correct. We don't think Excuse me. Tom, if you'd be so kind as to, to come to the podium. <clears throat> Thank you. We normally don't figure in an owner's contingency. Uh, when we do an estimate on the project uh, to bring forward to any committees. So that's probably the biggest difference. Um, in the past, we've tried to even put um, monies in our budget, Board of Ed budget, when there's projects going on because we know there's things they're going to run into um, that are unexpected uh, that we try and cover. So as part of the Sherman School project, we didn't have an owner's contingency in those estimates? Not in our estimate, not in the central office estimate. 
uh, before it went to a building committee? No. But it was in the building committee estimate? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. No, fine. I just had a couple follow-ups. Go right ahead. On the contingency numbers, and then I'll backtrack to um, another couple questions I had. Um, it looks like it's actually more than 10%. Can you give me the exact percentages of yeah, it, is, the six, is the 669 representative of 5%? I'm looking at scheme four on the project budget development history tab. Uh, on the owners? What, 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 what you're side? looking at, yeah, you know, he's looking at, looking at, at this, this right here. Okay. Yeah, I mean, is, are you telling me that 669 is 5% of 13,599? Is that what you're saying? I, I think that's what it should work out to. Okay, I mean, I don't yeah. have a calculator to try. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a formulaic, yeah, it right. should be 5%, yeah. And you said that the owner's project contingency was 5% as well, but that's 100K higher. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a little bit higher. It's 10 point something percent because when you factor in the construction contingency uh, as part of the project costs, I mean, this is really the last percentage we put on a project budget. So it's roughly 10%, but it's not exactly 10%. It's, it, it's a little higher. And again, it's a number that doesn't have to be 5%. It could be anything we want it to be. Um, I understand that. Right. So, but it's, it's north of 10% and it's broken up in those two buckets yes. roughly. Correct. Okay. And in, in relation to contingency, and um, I don't want to steal First Selectman Tetro's thunder, but I think he sort of touched on it with Sherman a little bit. Um, you know, something that happens in any project, you know, the scope creep, right? You get toward the end of a project and other things come up, other things need to be done, or sometimes the opposite. Sometimes there's a little bit of money left over and funds get spent for things that may not have been in the original defined project or list of things to be completed or purchased. So I just kind of want to understand from the committee's perspective in conjunction with the architects and the construction folks, how we will look to you know, effectively manage that process so that if there are things that need to be done, we know about it, how those choices will be made, and if there are funds left over, how we will or will not, how we might or might not use them for things that might not have been in this first package. Okay. Well, first of all, um, we're very cognizant of scope creep. Okay, that that been through all the options that we looked at. We made sure that we weren't participating in that. Right. Okay. Uh, but as we go along the project, there is no doubt in my mind that someplace along the line, we will have something that comes up that can be treated at either uh, a cost against a contingency, and maybe it's a scope creep, maybe it's not. Okay, but it has to go before the committee. We are not going to allow it just to be, you know, done by an outside concern. Right. The committee has the full responsibility to make sure what is there is approved by them. Right. And so, and we're very adamant about that. Yeah. Okay, very honestly. Uh, right. That's part of being cheap. Right. And, and you are absolutely correct, Mr. Quinn. The school needs to be addressed and needs to be addressed now. I'm, I'm fully on board with all of that. So maybe my question is more of a question between the two of you guys, and maybe you can't answer it now, but I, I'm not sure what process we might use or think about using for when those decisions need to be made. Because um, I know in past projects, history is history, you know, and I'm not portraying history upon this event. But it'll happen. Yeah, it certainly will happen, and it will happen beyond anyone's knowledge today, and that's all understandable. But I just want to make sure that we're all comfortable with, you know, when it does happen, how it will be addressed, and who will be the ultimate approver, typically the building committee, but how that will work with your office to make sure that there isn't, I hate to keep picking on Sherman, but a pull down screen that we might not want or, or that may not have been there. Um, let me take a shot at that. And, and uh, Mr. Cullen, Mr. Morbido, if, if I'm off base, please uh, come back. Uh, simply put, once we approve the money for the building committee, it's their money, right. right? If they run out of money, they come back to us if they go over budget. Right. Uh, if they choose to put, um, and, and forgive me for the, the uh, example I'm about to use because I know it's going to push some buttons, and I don't mean to do that, but I'm just trying to pick a very clear example. Right. If they choose to put copper roofing on, uh, as long as they're within budget, 
that's their call. They don't come back and review that with anybody else. If they choose to put uh, an automated uh, screen in, as long as they're within budget, that doesn't come back. The real key is what's the education uh, spec mm -hmm. and are they meeting that and are they staying within budget. So once we uh, approve the funding, the mm -hmm. ball is in their court. They can give us updates and we can request updates, uh, but they get to spend that money as they choose. Is that um, a fair ass ass no. assessment? Yeah. Now, to, to make to add on to that, if I right. might, uh, we also have ex officio members, okay, from the Board of Ed, and now one from the RTM okay. that'll be part of the committee. And quite obviously, I think part of the view, they're part of their responsibilities to be sure that we're spending the money in the right way. Right. As to all of us, okay, I can assure you um, that, you know, we're there to get a school building that is functional, right. that is well equipped, okay, and will work, right. okay. We're not there to put a surprise anywhere. Right. And I think the copper roofing, if anything, was a surprise. Whether or not it was good or bad, it's kind of irrelevant to me, but it was such a, a surprise to everybody. It should have been forwarded up, okay? And I think communications is part of that process. You're, you're touching on my question, right? Okay, and it's part of my responsibility to be sure that not only, you know, Tom Cullen and Sal mm -hmm. and Pam, okay, as the RGM member, Nick, and, right. and you guys, okay, I kept up to date. And if I do it, and I'm not doing it right, then fire me. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have the utmost of confidence in you and your committee. I'm just trying to no, I'm, understand I'm the kidding. process. But that's the truth. Yeah. No, no. I had a couple, Go ahead. Just, yeah, a just a couple more. Yeah, please. Oh, just same topic. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Um, and I think that, first of all, I should have started by saying, yes, Riverfield does need our help, and I couldn't agree more as well. So when I said that you had it right on many counts, I just wanted to follow up with Selectman Kylie's comments. And while I agree, and of course it's, it is so that the building committee will have responsibility as you know, I have again spoken with each of you clearly from the beginning, I think that sometimes in the um, going through the process there, we hear stories or different accounts about um, different needs that arise or for example there are people who are in the building who know the building well administrators or teachers and there might be communication informally here and then it's unclear as to how the, the clear path of communication is to the building committee who makes that decision so I guess just to follow up on Selectman Kylie I would hope that as your building committee and I'm sure with your military background it will be clear about that path of communication that, in other words, who is authorized and how to make those decisions, given that it is important to get input from the various folks who take care of the buildings, who are in the buildings, all of you on the committee, but that, again, that it's very clear that path of communication, and appreciate that you're willing to keep us all up to date, um, though it's not a requirement, I hear you saying that that's what you anticipate doing, and I certainly have been appreciating receiving your emails and um, being kept I, it's, it's necessary. It right. is a requirement. Yeah. You're spending town money. It's a requirement that we keep everybody in the loop. Okay? No surprises. Okay. Appreciate that. Uh -huh. Just a quick follow-up on uh, an earlier comment about where we are in the process. This is our first formal presentation, and, and typically, you know, our first formal presentation is you know, it has less detail than this, right? It's more conceptual, it's less factual, the numbers are a lot looser. So I think I heard, I forgot your name, sir. George. George, comment that since not just does it appear that we're further along in that process, but you have already commented on that, and I'd like you to further comment on that for us, that if we are indeed closer to more numbers, can you help me understand where you think that will take us as far as the likelihood of us being out of compliance or having large variances are in these figures between now and when we end up? Uh, it's anything is possible, but I think it's very remote. 
uh, because we've done all the groundwork initially to establish uh, a sound basis to begin with, uh, and because it's a conceptual estimate, the contingency line that you see there yeah. and the construction side is 13 percent. Mm -hmm. So that is there to account for any variables that we haven't accounted for yet. By the right. time we get to the construction documents and we're on the street to bid, that 11.666 is not going to change. Uh, so it's there to account for the variables as we go through the next steps. This is conceptual. Our next step is to do a schematic design, right. which is more advanced, more detail. Right. Construction managers on board, check estimate, make sure we're on board. Then we go into design development, another check estimate to make sure it's still in compliance on budget. Right. And every one of those check estimates, we have an opportunity to go back and re-examine our documents and right. do more engineering. Right. But you feel that you're relatively close to that number, and certainly, it appears that you're closer to the having high confidence in that number, given those contingencies, than maybe projects in the past might have been at this particular stage. The I, first can't, I can't speak to the past, but I'm happy with this. You're happy to speak to this, yes, sir. No, and, and that's all I can ask of you. Thank you. And I can assure you, project is 15 million. In fact, that was my very next question. Um, Not to exceed. Where did the 15 come from? Whose number was it? Okay. I guess I'll have to fess up. It's mine. <laughs> <laughs> we got 17-1, and I really couldn't see coming before this town with a $17 million budget. And I went to the committee and asked them to look at all of it and agree that $15 million was the number we, we could live with. And we sent back the architects and mm -hmm. our program managers to come up with that budget. And I, I certainly appreciate your, uh, your answer and your, um, you know, being sensitive to the financial elements of this project. But I have to ask myself one more question. Looking at the ed specs and looking at the request of the school itself, the students, the administrators, the, the parents, the Board of Education, I mean, are we at a point where they cannot accomplish everything that must be accomplished within the project at 15? Have, have, have we shortchanged it at 15 is what I'm trying to say. Okay. It's our judgment as a committee that we have not. You have not. Okay. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? No, I'm good for now. Kristen. And when we all back a while ago heard the initial $11 million um, then you hear 15 and that there's all the question about okay how how did we get there and I think you all have done a, a great job um, outlining some of the reason it's pretty pretty clear here specifically on the project program comparisons um, and this this one right here we have the pre-ed spec studies and then <coughs> scheme four my assumption is that scheme four comes directly from the ed spec. I just want to make sure that I am assuming that correctly, that everything on this scheme for was called for in the ed spec. called for in the ed spec. So I just wanted to hear that clearly. That was, so that's correct. So, okay. And then may I? Go ahead. Also related to this, um, total area of new construction in the pre-ed spec was 11,000 and the new construction in this yeah. is 32,884 with the renovated area of 34,343. With scheme four, what square footage is being lost? In other words, I, I assume ahead. this is not a net number. What square footage is being lost in order to get to scheme four? You're, you're removing, oh. so. Removing the bonds. So is this a net number? That's a net number. It yes. is a net number. Yeah, okay. the pot is gone. Okay. I did scheme four. Because we're going. Okay. Yeah, I was confused by that. Yeah. One, one of the problems with that pod is that we had students, some with special needs, in the middle of this pod with other kids walking around them. And I just found that extremely distasteful. Yeah. Inefficient. And inefficient. While we're there, can I just jump in if you don't mind? And when, let's look, looking at scheme four on that same chart, when I get to the bottom, I'm looking at total area of new construction 328 renovated area 34 gets me roughly to 67 well how big will the school be in total when the project scheme for is that 67 68 67 that's yeah. oh that's that's the whole that's building the, yeah 67 thousand yes sir okay with a little breakage I think it's 68 68 yeah. okay thanks 
I'm good on that. Um, site work, I'm thrilled to see that that was considered as part of this in terms of being more efficient and safer. Um, that's wonderful. One of my questions is, um, it's six buses is what is called for in the new plan. How many buses are accommodated now and how many buses are there? This may be to our principal. How many? Or, or maybe to Mr. Ficke, who's not here tonight. <laughs> six buses was the request. Oh, excuse me, sir. From the microphone, if you would, please. Six buses was the original request within the ad spec. Uh, and we can accommodate six full-size buses. Yeah, I'm not sure if they're using the full-size buses here or not. That I'm not that familiar with. So we'll, per the Board of Education, it will be sufficient in terms of meeting the ed specs and, and addressing it, it will meet the ed spec. I'm assuming that that meets it, what they need. Is your question how many are there today? Or how many are accommodated today? Yes. Oh, okay. I, I would say, it, I'm hearing, based on what I'm hearing, it sounds like this will be an improvement and will accommodate. That's really the bottom line of my question is, is can this new loop I, accommodate I the bus needs? I can't speak to how many buses come today. I can only address five. what was requested. Five. Yeah. All right. so you're going, okay, Thank thanks. You. <laughs> thanks. There you go. Okay. I have another, again, related to site plan. and. Mm -hmm. I am certainly appreciative of your sensitivity to the issues of the neighborhood, and I think we, uh, you know, we hear our first selectman talk about how important it is to be good neighbors, um, and that is important. And it's also important to balance that with the cost needs as well. Um, so, the plantings, the screening plants that we saw, and the the brickwork design are the plantings themselves. Is that all included in the cost? Yes. Oh yes, yeah. that's part of the estimate already. Yes. Yeah, but just so there's no confusion, the site work includes the plantings and all the, you know, parking and so forth, but mm -hmm. also includes drainage and all the other things that go into the site, mm -hmm. anything outside the building. Mm -hmm. So it's not just beautification, so you know, we have some plants. Are you still on site? I can, I can. I have a site question. Could you possibly put the site plan back up. I just want to make sure I have my, I'm looking at it the right way, please. North, north is up, right? Correct. Correct. Yes, right. So the plantings that are pictured, I don't know, on the previous page, on the rendering, rendering. on the rendering, north edge. Where are they going? Along here. Along there. We're nominally expanding this parking area closer to the property lines. Uh -huh. So we would envision installing buffer plantings up on that edge to there. give the neighbors more, more privacy. Okay. Uh, and, the, and, and the way the building was designed, this is the actual addition. This is uh -huh. the end of the existing building. Uh -huh. We were very sensitive not to decrease the setback between, right the, between the building and the property. We were trying to maintain the same separation for the, right. the benefit of the neighbors. Zoning will allow you to go down to seven feet. <laughs> we know it's never going to happen. It's pretty close. No. Yes, it's very close. Yeah, right. So, so the plantings are on the northern edge of the building between there and the homes, not on the eastern or southern Correct. portion of the building. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And that came directly out of meetings with the neighborhood. Yeah, which makes perfect sense. They, uh, they, they are very close on that north side. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Kevin, okay, Go ahead. Yeah, please. So along the same lines. And so, again, prevention, we talked about that earlier with our police chief. And um, you, I know that neighbors have been attending, some of the neighbors have been attending the meeting, meetings, your building committee meetings. And it sounds like there has been, I don't know if I just heard you say, a conversation with a neighbor or a group of neighbors. We had a neighbor meeting. That's, that's exactly meeting what I was getting at. Which, I love uh, we had 26, I believe, neighbors attend. Okay, so yes. So you reached out to them, came together, and met, and that's great. And we used some of their ideas, to be honest. Like, that's great. No, we're not proud. No. That's beautiful. <laughs> uh, I have. Another no, please go ahead. Um, occupied renovation and construction. Um, 
you alluded to it in your comments in terms of this scheme was chosen in part because it allowed for a safe and efficient moving of students around the building that would separate and having been a Stratfield school parent I respect uh, the importance of that and my question is um, are there where are the costs that uh, are there extra costs related to that for example I recall at Stratfield school there were some barriers that had to be constructed and some different things that needed to happen are there extra costs related to the fact that it's an occupied renovation and if so where would we see that there is no specific line item for that amount but the efficiency of this plan is by removing the existing pod they would mm -hmm. build this classroom wing first so the current pod has seven rooms in it this will create 16 brand new rooms so when that addition is finished they can then rotate and close classrooms within the space and move students into it mm -hmm. and, and, and still use the, the portables out back to accommodate the entire population. Uh, it's going to minimize the amount of shifting going around. It's going to minimize the amount of temporary work going on uh, relative to segregating the construction crews from the occupied building. This is a plan that will evolve with our construction manager once they're hired. Uh, and, and our general condition costs and some of that contingency cost may go towards implementing that plan, which is one of the reasons why you have a decent sized contingency. The specifics aren't accounted for, but we know we can keep everyone safe and separated. So at this point, yes, there's a long way to go, but at this point the plan would be to remove that part of the building and then place those students in the portables. And, during and within the condensed program space within the building. We, we had discussions with, with Brenda. I mean, you can use uh, some various spaces and, you know, there's ways to accommodate it. We haven't detailed it specifically, but part of our discussion with administration was that, you know, are we reasonable? And we've been led to believe that we are. Okay. And that's, I'm sure, requires a lot of creativity because it's already very tight in that building. So um, I'm sure that would, and, and I don't doubt the principal's ability to do that. Um, so it sounds like you have the plan cost-wise. It's kind of part of the whole estimate and pieces here and there. I, we believe we do, yes. We've captured and identified the major components of it, and we can do it within the budget that's been stated. That's for now. Please. A couple of things. Um, the new plan ends up with 99 parking spaces. Yes. Where are we at today? 108. 108. 108. So it actually goes down. Yeah. The, the, okay. the head spec is 90. The head spec requested between 90 and 100 cars. All right. So that, that, that's an agreeable outcome. Well, everyone wants more spaces. <laughs> it's, a, it's a suburban site. Uh, right. And beyond the obvious parking that we have for events, the, the bus drop off alley can be used for parking. Mm -hmm. uh, the basketball court can be used for overflow parking. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just limited to how much ground space there is, uh, but right. we're meeting the ed spec is all I can say. Good. I'd also like to add that you know the, the parent drop off. Sir, if you, you could use. come closer to yeah, the mic. Can. Uh, the the parent drop off also at night could be used. So you got 17 spaces there. You oh. got 99 other spaces, so that's 116 spaces. You got spaces that could be used here. So ultimately, oh, you had a lot. Those won't be fire lane spaces that you could not park in? Not the parking lane. Yeah. No, there's still an area here. Huh? Okay. Right. I, I would think there's, in, in that one pinch where you have an all school Meeting. play or something, you can make it work. You can make it work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, my next question, I believe, is from Mr. Cullen, and that is on portables. Uh, just quickly, uh, where we are today with the number of portables and where we will be post Riverfield. Oh, I should have been ready for As that. As that number has dipped over the last decade or yeah, so. Yeah, when Thank I you. came in 2000, system-wide, not just at Riverfield. Yes, yes. system-wide, yes, yes. Uh, when I was hired in 2002, we had 61 portables at Fairfield. Yeah. Uh, we're down to 15, of which one is at transportation, one route highway. Okay. So there's five at this school. Those five will go away. So we're down to 10, uh, roughly. Nine, nine at schools. Nine. Thank you. That, that's progress yeah. over time, right? Very good. It is. My next question, kind of two phase, if I can find it here. Bear with me for one second. Sure. If I go back to 
the project design and goals uh, page. You know, there's 17 items here that are listed, and these, you know, are the items that are drivers of the project post ed spec input. Yes. So I guess my question is, without without any real reason for asking it, without any purpose behind it or hidden purpose, are these in order of either importance, priority, or need, or is it just an just a list? It's a list. It's just a list. There's no like this one's more it's important a, than that no. one, anything like that. There's no prioritization. Okay. Good. And secondly, is there anything on this list that it, that becomes compromised or eliminated going from 17.1 to 15 million? No. No? Not, not, not either in scope or need or anything like that? No, sir. Uh, our first charge was to meet the requirements of the ed spec, mm -hmm. uh, and we believe we have. Uh, some of the efficiencies that were gained in the reduction of it was in the site work. We were trying to minimize the amount of work in this area, so we saved some money on the site work. We saved some, some funding on uh, some of the uh, upgrades that we were doing. Uh, we, had a, we had a kitchen line item renovation cost of $500,000. Mm -hmm. uh, we think we can do it for, for two fifty. dollars Yeah, and, and, and very honestly, okay, we went through this very closely. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and to answer your question on a very direct basis, the updated kitchen facility you're getting Mm -hmm. But not two serving lines right now. Not till we go out to bid and mm -hmm. find out. That's part of the contingency. Right. Okay? We've mm -hmm. got the one serving line in there. And we elected to remove it, the second one out, okay, pending going out in the contingency and getting a bid. Mm -hmm. With the with the likely anticipation that there will be room in the contingency to bring something like that back in. That is correct. Which is something that's really needed there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, right. So okay. Um, quickly, square footage. So of the 68,000 square feet, we always have to um, work with the state on these projects. So can you quickly walk me through on um, scheme for where we might stand on a state reimbursement level as far as how much would qualify, how much might not qualify, and how that stands up against the other versions that you considered and against the total project? Hi, Sal Morbido. Hey, Sal. Um, our reimbursement rate, our, our gross rate, and you're, you're asking about eligibles and ineligibles. Right. Uh, right now, runs about 26% is our gross uh, yeah. eligible uh, rate. Uh, that's on eligible items for reimbursement. Typically, we're netting on this type of project. I'm using. Um, Fairfield Woods and Stratfield as an um, uh, example, probably around 22%. Uh, we've had a range over the years of, say, just below 19% uh, yep. up up to 22 and a half, but uh -huh. they're running 21, 20, roughly 20. 21, 22% okay. net. Um, it's hard without the actual details to say where's the eligible, ineligible mm -hmm. portion of that. Right. So as a round number, you want to talk yeah. 20, 25, uh, 20, 22 percent is eligible, right. you wouldn't be wrong. Right. Could I request some type of, even if it's a little rough because of where we are in the process, just a rough estimate and analysis of what looks like it might be reimbursable, give or take some change, and what that number might look like in the end. I don't need it tonight or even this week. Just kind of, just, just to start getting a feel for of I 15, think something can be sketched out. X is potentially reimbursable if, if all these things happen. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. That. Anything else? Um, not at the moment. Well, I have a couple other things, but I don't want to take the floor. Go ahead. I have a, a few more. Um, the entryway, you talked about, obviously, this week especially, I think we're all very sensitive to that issue. And um, I, you talked about you, the ability to have a a security desk there um, and wondering if there's I can't really tell on the drawing if there's glass in between and in fact actually I'm wondering if I can get a larger copy of this yes. would, no, maybe that would be helpful for all three of us I don't know yeah um, give you a larger copy. that would be great yeah. uh, soft copy is great but just where this space is and, and the 
office being here, is there the ability or is it called for to have some kind of glass window there? So yes, that the people yeah, there is. So okay. if you see this right here, you gotta, you're going into this and the desk is right here. Security desk, but if it's if, if it's desired, these doors, double doors, are locked. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. glass here from that's, the that's uh, right. office into that area, and there's an actual door. So when somebody okay. gets, yeah. comes in through this yeah. door, they can't get any further. They have to come in through the office door, get buzzed in, whatever you want, and then they continue from there out to the rest of the school. So essentially, you have to check in. Mm -hmm. And that came from the Board of Ed, that came from, we've done it in all of our schools now. Uh, so that there's a series of barriers before you get in. And the technology for the buzzing in and all that is, is part of the project yes. that's in yeah. place? Okay. All right. Thank you. And this camera is bright. Yeah. May, may I follow up on that? Because that was one of the things I wanted to talk about. And Again, it, it is a difficult time to talk about this, but security is uh, paramount. And we've talked about this on previous building projects on what we were doing and what made sense. And um, every building's different age, different style. You know, they're laid out differently. But I'm sure you folks are, have already thought about this, and Dr. Title and Chairman Dwyer have already thought about this. But I guess I would just ask the group to, you know, put your thinking caps on and put your heads together and find out you know what we can do today here that is you know top grade as part of this project and find a way to implement and roll something out to all of our schools that's either similar or close to similar depending on how the buildings are so that we can be both secure and consistent across our 16 schools because right now we aren't and it would be impossible for us to be based on the buildings but it's a good time to think about that, and it's a good time. To, it's, I, I think it's a great time to put that issue on the table and 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 address it globally yeah. for the town. Yeah, we, yeah. we agree with you. I'm, if, I'm sure you're way ahead of me. Just, but. just to, to address that, the meeting started. Um, conversation started over the weekend. Meeting started already this week, uh, where Dr. Title, uh, Chief McNamara, and I are already sitting down, uh, looking at at security uh, from that standpoint. Uh, what I would ask to address this component is there's a security re review. Uh, done with uh, our police department as we go through this um, end of the debt degree and then I would ask that um, as much as we make sure that's on the checkpoint that we also don't try and, and step through all the security precautions in a public meeting because that defeats the purpose of a security plan right. um, in terms of telling everybody what's up so I think it's very important for our parents for our students for us as a community to know that we have that security program in place and that it's been stepped through by the appropriate experts uh, but I also think it's in everybody's best interest that we don't necessarily discuss that in detail uh, at this meeting. So on my list, and, and I guess different than what we've done with prior building committees, <laughs> that there somewhere is a uh, checkpoint for a security review. Uh, that uh, and, and I don't know how that fits with FOI, but we'll have to sort out how we do that to make sure that's not done in a public format. But we also still make sure everybody's comfortable that that step was gone through so that we know these schools are as secure as we can possibly. I, I can assure you we'll be gone through, number one. And, and number two, it's an ideal time if you're going to make changes in security. You do it while you're remodeling. Right. Yeah. Okay? Come you do on. it now. Right. Sorry, Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, no, that, that's a great follow-on, and thank you for the information. Uh, much appreciated. A um, couple other questions for me. Um, abatement issues. That's another hot topic, uh, considering what's happening up at Osborne Hill. So I don't know. If, if that's completely covered within contingency, if we're comfortable yet, um, if we have any concerns, any known issues to date um, compared to what are some of our other schools might, you know, be going through. Let me address this school. Yeah. Okay. We know where we have a problem in the areas where we're going to be working. You do. Okay. And we have a cost estimate of $405,000 to abate those in the areas we're working. That doesn't mean the whole school. Okay, so the areas that we go into and work, we have done the testing. We know what we have to get rid of, mm -hmm. and we've planned for it. Okay, if the school board selectmen want to go through the whole building, it will be incremental. Okay. Can I follow up on that? If, if I go back to the square footage, the thirty-two thousand of eight 
the, the 32.8 of new footage, I'm assuming there's no abatement issues there, but of the existing 34,000 that's being renovated to some degree or touched, I just don't know, since those two numbers comprise the total building, right, so I don't know where within that 34,000 square feet that we are touching or um, upgrading to some degree where we might trigger any abatement questions or issues or concerns. Uh, the majority of the abatement costs are going to be incurred where we're breaking into the new building to put our additions on, because that's where you find the things in the caulking and in the, behind the masonry there's asbestos in the, in the rock, plus the entire pod that's going to be removed needs to be abated before it's removed. You just can't knock it down and send it to the landfill. So, so the, when Tom said the areas that we're working in, wherever our construction is going to be touching the existing building, uh -huh. is where we're focusing the abatement costs. Okay. There's, uh, we did a complete inspection of the building and identified those areas. It wasn't just a seat of the pants estimate. The estimate was put together by our hazmat consultant. There are various areas in the building that we're touching in the floor tiles. Those will be all replaced. So where we're really doing demolition work is are the areas where we're going to be abating. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any more? I think I'm good for now. Yes. Ahead. Um, and perhaps I should have started with this way back in the beginning, but <laughs> just sitting here listening, um, it would be helpful if you could walk us through, Mr. Quinn, a little bit about the decision to remove the pod area versus trying to make use of that. And I know I heard some conversation about that at early building committee meetings, but perhaps if you could just help us with the thought process there. One of the things being, some people might say, well, wouldn't it be less expensive to leave that in place and work around it? So if you could yeah. just walk us through that. Um, we actually went through many, many design iterations and one of them was saving the pod. Uh, it turned out that when you do that, because it's not efficient, it's an odd shape, there's wasted space, you have to add other building area to make up for that. So, you know, you ended up with the scheme where we kept the pod, we ended up with a whole other area out here. And so it was less efficient, it was more circuitous, it was less sustainable because you got more roof, uh, and um, uh, it just, it turned out the difference, cost difference was minimal. So it turned out that the most efficient thing to do, uh, again, we talked about the phasing and making sure the kids could be in the building, is when you knock down the pod, all, the, all those classrooms in the pod can go into the current portables and some other small spaces that they would kind of team up with. Mm -hmm. That comes off, you build this two-story addition. Those seven classrooms, actually the kindergarten, first grade, the fourth and fifth, all go back into here. Now you've got those pods left over for these guys to swing out and use those spaces to renovate. And they come back, it's all one move each time. And these guys come into the portables, they renovate that. Mm. The cost actually that you're saving is both by eliminating the pod is not only the physical cost of the construction, but it's the phasing of how, it, you know, the moving of the kids, which, which relates into cost. Right. So, mm. I mean, I don't know if that answers it, but. No, so you're, that was part of my question earlier is about the, the phasing mm -hmm. right. piece. Yeah. And, and what you're saying is that by eliminating the pod, let me, I just want to make sure I'm hearing this correctly, that we're actually saving construction costs. Ultimately, yes. Ultimately, yes. Yeah. Quick and long-term costs. Yeah. Good, yeah. And long-term and long up, up, uh, up upkeep costs. Because right. the scheme where we had the pod saved and added all this, now you've got mm -hmm. a courtyard to upgrade, you've got more roof area to keep, you know, you got to replace the roof at some point, so there's more roof area to cost. You've impacted on the, on the flood uh, area, you've impacted on the fields. Right. The inefficiency of the pod as it exists, I mean, reality is this addition touches all the corners of the pod, and it's so much more efficient. You're getting 16 classrooms where seven existed, essentially. So, it, you know, it took us a while to get to that point because we had to actually go through all those studies. But it is more efficient to do it that way because not only are you saving, as I said, you're saving on the phasing costs. When we actually looked at some of these other schemes, we were like, well, how are you going to, 
how are they going to uh, move from here to here? And you know, it just re it, it required lots of moves, and that's going to not only cost money in construction, but it's going to cause program the school to have difficulties during the construction. This seems to be the cleanest way to do it. In addition, let me just say that the pod, the pod, nobody likes the pod. I mean, literally, that was the very first thing that came out of it. People just also didn't like it. So you're sort of fixing something that's been a sore spot, so to speak. Yeah. On, on the pods, the pods, I'm going back a few years. The pods, how old are they? Four or five years? Or are they older than that? No, uh, different pod, pods. The different the, pods. The port, you get the portables, and the pod is that triangular. Right. The, the pods you're thinking about, are you referencing Sherman and Osborne Hill pods? Yes. Okay. You're, but you're wondering how old that part of yeah. the building is. Yeah. I think it was the 70s. 70, 70, 70, 70, 71. 71? Okay. Thank you. Follow up. Just you, you're using the word sustainable, and um, that's important because we certainly will pay, or the plan is that we are going to pay to do work on this. But then there's going to be upkeep and the the costs over time, right. um, energy costs and maintenance costs, roofing. You talked about all that. What kinds of things have been done to make this more energy efficient? I know the lead standards are incorporated if you could speak to the lead standards and what are some of the examples of what you're doing so that we are saving costs over the long run i'll just speak to the overall one the footprint is tighter by coming doing the scheme so and your envelope is tighter it's, you know you have a to do a two-story piece as opposed to spreading this out okay. you have less footing you have less heating you can get the heat that rises up from the first floor to the second floor so you're saving that and george has done a lot with the i think i'll have you comment on some of the other environmental Issues. Uh, just if I could, just to define the word saving correctly, you're talking about saving of the, over the alternative design concepts, yes. not yeah, necessarily over the building yeah. as it exists today? Right. Well, yeah, because the square footage is going up anyway. So the answer is yes to your it is versus the other alternatives. Yeah, what's the square okay. footage in the building today and what will it be when we're done? Uh, you remember that, Brian? Is it just square, uh, square footage today, about 40 something. Yeah, it's probably six. I would say 44,000. So this building would be about 46,000. So this building would be about 50% bigger than it is yes, today. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Just to clarify, the building bricks and mortar square footage, plus we have five portables. Um, we don't count. Not count right, yeah. that's not yeah. counted in okay. the square footage. Right. But okay. No, I'm good. This yeah. This room. Did you have any more? Not for this very moment, no. Okay. And if I might, what's the, um, uh, just and look at the numbers on contingency to see if I'm, I'm reading this right. There is, are these pages numbered? No, they're not. Okay. Then let me, uh, okay. that's where I am. The two number sh charts that you have, one has estimated contingency at 1.3 million. Yes. Yes. Okay, and then over here it says total contingency 1.26. So between the two, that's 2.5 million in contingency? Yeah, okay, so you're talking about the estimated contingency in the construction budget the development, and then you're talking about the contingency on the project budget development. Yeah, just yes. trying, just trying yep. to clarify. So that's a total of. Yeah, I mean, they're not, I mean, again. The, the, close to 20% contingency between the two? Right, but they're not necessarily, you know, looked at the same light. I mean, the, the construction estimated contingency developed here is for the fact that um, this entire $11.6 million budget was developed off of drawings that look like, like, like this, you know, very s diagrammatic, very rough, very conceptual uh, documents. And... Again, from a financial management standpoint, when you're estimating a project um, and you have limited documentation for the unknowns that George was talking about earlier, you need to build estimators, professional estimators that do this for a living, need to build in that estimating contingencies to cover the stuff that the millwork, uh, the type of carpeting, the type of finishes, the type of the specific type of windows that may change, the trim work. There's a lot of unknowns at this point, and as we further 
test a scheme for through estimating, that contingency value goes down. So right now it's 13%. When we do a schematic design estimate, it'll be 10%. When we okay, but your plan right now would be come back with a request for funding next month. So correct. this would be the level of detail that we would have. That yeah, correct. that's correct. We're not doing any further advance of the documentation until we have okay. approvals. Um, Mr. Cullen or somebody from the central office, is this the level of detail we normally get when we do a request for funding? Do we normally have almost 25% contingency in there? Yes, that was similar to your Excuse me. Oh, sorry. So I don't know if you could take the mic. Sorry. Didn't sorry that. about that. Oh. Your booming voice doesn't carry quite to the mic. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> um, that was about the, the level of contingency on uh, the Fairfield Woods project. Mm -hmm. um, it worked into uh, right in, into their budget. Strathfield um, debated a little bit longer, might have had slightly more detail. Um, Sherman was probably a little bit less than this. So it's, it's right in the ballpark of where you probably would want to be. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then from a standpoint of, of school capacity, what are the number of students there now and what will the capacity be when we're done? Okay, the uh, number of students is 414? 423. 423 right now. And this is uh, by uh, educational spec 505. What? 504. 504. Okay. okay. I'm a liar for one. I'm sorry. Okay. So that's about uh, 80 more students. Yes. Um, when we look at, at the specs, is there anything in this plan that's being developed that's not in every other elementary school that we have? I believe that was one of the questions last fall. We, the uh, and and. Just part of what I'm harking back to is, is we went through several meetings with this project through the Board of Selectmen, uh, initially starting um, prior to your tenure, and, and I think then after. Um, and so we, we had several presentations on this, uh, and I'm just trying to get my head around um, how we went from an 11 million ballpark to 17 million, and you've gotten it back to 15 million. But that's, that's a rather big jump, given the level of, of detail and presentations that we heard um, in the fall, so I'm just trying to get to where we are there. So, um, and one of the questions I believe uh, Selectman Stedek asked at the time is, what was in, what was going to be included here that was wasn't in other elementary schools? Do we have a list of those, or is I do not. Okay. Is there anybody from the central office or the board of ed who can put that together? Uh, specifically, what's in this school that's not in every other elementary school? Sure. Um, uh, Phil Dwyer from board chair of the Board of Education. Uh, when you use the word every other school, uh, I'll qualify it by saying that the design standards that we've used are for schools that will serve 504 children. And so we've tried to be consistent with the, what is in schools that are being designed for 504 children. Uh, and so this meets that condition. Yeah, actually all I'm trying to do mm -hmm. is get back to the question that was asked a year ago yeah. and see if the answer is the same. I can ask that question. Mm -hmm. um, part, of the, part of the issue is that, in, is there anything different than what's in el other elementary schools that in, in terms of the ed spec? No, but, they, but where you're seeing a difference is that in between our other construction, school construction times and now is that we um, hired um, MGT um, to do a deficiency report for our schools and we now which you've all seen so they've specifically outlined what schools have what and where their deficiencies are based on population so one of the charges the building committee gave the architect was to go through that deficiency report and determine what Riverfield was missing and what needed to be addressed so that's one, that's one of the reasons why those things are the way that they are, why the numbers are so different. Um, it's hard to answer the question what's in there that's not in other schools. Um, we're really now just trying to make up for the deficiencies as we move forward, okay. if that helps. All right, thank you. Just try. Go right ahead. And thank you for that. I, I think that especially when we look at some of our older schools, 
and again, I'm a Stratfield parent, so mm -hmm. I've seen the change in that school when my children started there versus now, and it has been renovated and, and um, had an addition. I think to what you're saying to Mr. Petro is that we have some of our older schools who don't have some of the things compared to Burr, McKinley, Stratfield, those who have been addressed in the past or the more recent past. Correct. So I think that that's, I think that's part of why you're saying it's a hard question to answer. So I, that's maybe to try and get it more specifically what you're looking for. Actually, the, the question was, I thought, pretty straightforward back then. What happens when we talk scope creep, as, as Mr. Right. Kiley brought up earlier? Uh, every time we change the target, there's scope creep. Every time we add something in that's not in every other school, we now have to put it in every other school. So the question then becomes, what things are we adding here that we will then go back and have to revise the, the long-range plan on? We've gone from a $5 million project at Sherman that we couldn't build because we're in a flood zone, so we had to cut it back to a smaller number. Uh, we. And, and at least as my recollection, totally redid Stratfield School. Totally redid. I walked through there. You couldn't tell old from new. It looked like we built it from the ground up. I know we didn't. We did that for $17 million. We went in to do a project here to expand the core in some areas, and it's $17 million. Does this then, what does this do to, to the long-range plan for the Board of Ed? Does this change? This? I mean, that's 50% up from what our estimate was and that eleven million dollar estimate had more detail than any other estimate I think mr. Cullen we haven't had architects come in with rough sketches I know they weren't to the detail that we do here but we never did that much before so part of what we were trying to do last fall is give credence credibility to the eleven million dollar number not that that we were going to build it for eleven million but it would be there this is fifty percent or more higher uh, and and so I'm trying to get my head around Fifteen million dollars. It and didn't. What that it, it, it if, didn't if, address the if, if, it's the deficiencies. If, if if I could finish. That's the answer to the question. If I could finish. What I'm trying to get my head around is what that means to the rest of the capital planning, what our capital requirements are as a town. All right, and what this does to every other school project within within that long range plan, because we're about to do a capital planning workshop and look at some of these numbers, um, and I'm trying to get an, a feel for what that means. It means that we're going to have to address the deficiencies at all the other schools. And Dr. Title has told the board that we are going to have to update our long range plan. Um, it was something that we lightheartedly said we didn't want to have, to, we, we voted on it and didn't want to have to go back and address it because it's such a long winded issue. Um, but, you know, he said that that's going to have to come back and it's something that we're going to have to look at. So, in terms of the capital workshop, uh, the Board of Ed is saying that you're not comfortable with what those numbers are we're going to look at in a month? I don't know what numbers you're going to look at in a month. I don't know what the chairman's put together, so I, I don't know what you're going to see, but I do know that the space deficiencies do need to be addressed. I think we use the numbers out of the long-range plan. And, and I don't know how far out, you know, off not having them in front of me, I'm not sure which projects you're looking at for what time frame to answer that question. Okay. Let me, if I may, just mm -hmm. piggyback on this. I think one of the concerns that you're looking at is that the moving target, which is in part the nature of, I don't want to use the word business, but the, the situation, certainly we evolve educationally and we learn. Um, but I think for me, what would be interesting to know would be, we'll take Stratfield or Fairfield Woods, that, that's not an elementary school, but how do the more recent projects compare to this? In other words, those specifically those that we have done more recently, for McKinley Stratfield, how how does that compare from an ed spec standpoint, which might help get at a little bit of what Mr. Tetro is asking. For. The recent stuff is comparable, and I can't answer your capital planning thing because I don't know what the time frame I is. I don't know what the years are. I didn't expect you to answer it here. I'm just trying to get a feel for yeah. what some of the work that we need to do offsite. I, I know it's not related to Riverfield, right. but from a town standpoint, a capital planning standpoint, it's very important uh, yeah. that we get to that. And uh, also just trying to see what questions maybe we need to be prepared to address. Putting out. And, and it's not for this topic, and it's not on this agenda, right. so I didn't mean to get into that. No, no, I just apologize for not knowing the years out for that. All right, thank you. 
let's see, can, uh, in terms of looking at the project program comparisons, the pre-ed spec was six new classrooms. This is 16 new classrooms. Can somebody address um, total number of rooms and then total number of classrooms, and, and how did it grow that fast? What were we missing last fall? What was the, what did the ed spec define differently? Because the ed spec was developed last fall. It was not developed before you had that architect. Yeah. Excuse me, Mr. Quinn. The ed spec was developed last fall. It was presented at a board of selectmen meeting. At the same time, we were looking at, at doing this because we, we wanted it developed before we assigned the building committee. So I'm not. This is not critical of the building committee. I'm just trying to understand, from a planning standpoint, the 11 million dollar estimate. When we came out with the ed spec, if that dramatically changed what we were trying to accomplish, uh, how did we miss that in the presentations to the board of selectmen a year ago? Is there anybody here who can answer that? back to uh, Phil Dwyer again. It goes back to one of the comments Ms. Iacona said that there is a uh, report that says here are the deficiencies within a school. Mm -hmm. The ed spec that was put together last fall had classrooms but also resource rooms that needed to be added. Um, I would have to look at the detailed plans to see if they added more classrooms than what we asked for but I doubt it or more resource rooms than we asked for but I doubt it. So um, it wasn't just classrooms we were after, it was classrooms and resource rooms yeah. and for yeah. staff. What I'm trying to get back to in the same meetings that we were discussing this, we were given an ed spec yeah. and prior to that we were given the, the, the rough outline. We go from six classrooms to 16, two special ed rooms to four resource rooms, one language room to three language rooms plus a language speech room. Just trying to figure, if it, yeah. it changed, that's more than just we're we're putting an automated screen in versus a pull down screen. Uh, Those are functionally dramatically different spaces. Okay, so asking and it that was, way. And I was just trying to figure yeah. out how we went from since those two pieces were known at the same time. We have a plan without the ed specs and we in essence whoever put that plan yeah. together had some version of ed specs, even yeah. if it wasn't officially passed by the Board of Ed, to a more detailed version of the ed specs that went from let's just take six classrooms to sixteen classrooms. I can, I can yeah, respond and to that. that so the building committee could probably answer that question. That aspect of it relates to the existing seven that we're removing. So you're taking down the seven old ones, and that's part of the 20 new classroom count. The, the entire ed spec said we need X amount of classrooms total within our building. So that accounts for some of it. So there's really, you know, the difference is, is nine new spaces beyond what was there currently. And, and the rest of the spaces are, again, what's detailed within the ed spec requirement. I, I can't talk to what was done pre-ed spec. Uh, I, I just know that the estimate that we were looking at that we call pre-ed spec was dated October 5th, and the final ed specs, the approved ed specs that we were given were dated sometime in December. And I'm sure if you saw them simultaneously, I can't dispute that, but that's the only difference that I can account for. Yeah, from a process standpoint, I'm trying to get to what was presented versus what we ended up. And if we're seeing this dramatic change going from the presentation to the ed spec, how do we get that included in the discussion sooner than now? Because I'm still trying to get my head around 11 million to 15 to 17 million. And that's, that's a, a little bit of a sticker shock. It's not good or bad, it's just sticker shock in terms of looking at that. Okay. Just to follow up, let's, if we could go back to just the six classrooms and 16 new. Maybe if you could just step by step walk through the six new classrooms on the pre-ed spec studies. The assumptions were based on leaving the pod as it was. If, you know what I'm saying? In other words, help us get from the six to 16. And when well, it's new classrooms, those are the full size yes. spaces, the not scheme, the, the other. scheme 2B concept that we evaluated early on left the pods uh, and, and in fact we were putting a one classroom addition onto the pod so they can get eight rooms instead of seven out there because it was an odd number get two fourth grades two fifth grades uh, so once that came down uh, we put it all back and, and the extensive addition that was going off the back of that building to accommodate the space it, it was a very similar plan to what the uh, pre-ed spec plan was, the cartoon that was developed. They call it a cartoon because it was very, very, very preliminary. And the other big jump in this number accounts for the renovation of the interior space. 
uh, from what we could see, the alterations on the original plan accounted for 1,100 feet, I think it was? 11,000. No, 1,100 square feet of renovation. 1,500. 1,500. Yep. And we're renovating the entire building, replacing no work, replacing things that are, are all the lockers. I mean, there was a line item for lockers in the original spec, I know. Uh, but uh, the, the, it, it's, it, it's what it is. I think that's what, what I'm trying to get at is you're, there, there aren't going to be somehow, you know, 10 new classrooms for fourth, fifth, sixth grade. You're, when you talk about renovating in Millbrook and doing all that, and Mr. Tetro's talking about what happened at Stratfield, the way that I hear this is that this is actually similar in, in thought in terms of the renovation slash addition. Am I, maybe Mr. Cullen or Mr. Morbido, that, that would be a question for you because I think Mr. Tetro is asking a valid question. We had one set of thoughts about this and, and he's, he's using the strap field and I hate to use them. I talked about this today in the Learning to Look program, compare and contrast. So could you help us maybe using strap field since it's done and we can see it and it's a tangible to understand how the scope of this project might compare or contrast with the Stratfield project. And, and perhaps from a big number standpoint, were there any additional square footage added in the Stratfield and how much was renovated? So we can compare yeah, it to Stratfield the... Stratfield sale knows more of, but I can tell you um, the conceptual design uh, to bring Riverfield to the town bodies uh, was to get rid of the portable classrooms, which there are five out there. When we looked at a 504 scheme, that we wanted to meet and that the Board of Ed supports, uh, we realized that the newer schools, the newer elementary schools don't have a science room. So that's where we came up with the six classroom addition. The five portables go away, we need to replace those in one science room. Then we have to look at the MGT report, which shows the deficiency in capacity deficiencies of uh, ancillary spaces. So spaces for the psychologists, the social workers, the special ed classrooms, and uh, all of those get worked into the into the design. We didn't go in and look at extensively for a year demolishing the pod and uh, you know four, five, six, seven, eight schemes. We looked at leaving the pod. It existed. Um, we had a roof replacement a few years ago there and an HVC a piece of equipment so we tried to leave it and then we added on to that pod either with an L shape or with the long building going across the back where the field is and having a courtyard. We always did look at the gymnasium one of the things I wanted you to know is with 11 elementary schools, none of the gyms are the same size. They range from 2,400 square feet to 4,000 square feet. Riverfields is the third smallest gym in the district, and we were holding two classes in there at a time to try and meet the curriculum need. So we knew the gymnasium had to grow. We also know that the second serving line in the kitchen and getting the children in quicker and eating has worked at several of the locations we wanted to do that we looked at the size of the APR getting the stage out of that APR and expanding that APR gets us five tables of eight uh, so that expands it we get the second serving line so those are the kinds of things we looked at with a preliminary architect with very little money to come together uh, uh, some type of a cost estimate that uh, could approve this project and move it so I wanted to say those things and then Sal can talk to you about Stratfield because he was in charge of that project with the team. Um, backtrack on Stratfield, what did we get that we didn't get here? Is that basically the question, or can you reach? Well, I think well we got more at Stratfield than we got here for the same money. I think we should follow that guy. Strat Stratfield is a very interesting project in of its timing. It hit the construction market when the world was ending. Uh, markets were collapsing. It got the best construction prices imaginable. Uh, the original, uh, when Mr. Kelly, the chairman of the Stratford Building Committee, was first talking to uh, um, this board, Board of Finance, uh, RTM, just heads up where we are and we're going to work down. Uh, he came a little bit far, uh, sooner. And uh, uh, Mr. Quinn and was actually talking about the the numbers before they ve down, and they were coming around with over a twenty million dollar number. 
that's when they first started, and they drove it down to that $17 million. About what the, the point is here. When they actually bid out the project, they got very aggressive numbers. There were people buying the job to keep the work because the market was collapsing for construction work. Exceedingly good prices. There were parts of work that were VE'd out that were brought back in. It was all market driven. So, you know, you got the benefit of the, the greatest construction market prices in, in the last 15, 20 years. Um, if you, you know, just a guesstimate, if you were going to do that today, you'd probably be up over the $20 million mark just because prices are rising easily because the, there was big deltas in what the expected bids were going to be and what actually came in. So, got a great bargain <coughs> in Stratfield, let's put it that way. Uh, as far as this project, uh, the level, uh, it, it's hard to directly compare it to a Stratfield because of the type of renovation it is. Um, but the difference between that pre-conceptual budget, um, to answer the question about the classrooms, uh, seven of those classrooms are what we're talking about, the difference between demolishing the pod wing, um, seven and six classrooms, that's 13, so you're talking about the three classroom difference, and George and Ken can speak a little bit more to where that <coughs> delta came up, but um, it's really not that far off in, in the conceptual um, spaces that, that were designed for. Uh, as far as the numbers used to extend the, the budget, um, it's more about the detail as George explained. As you get farther along with better drawings, you can get to a tighter, tighter number or closer to the actual construction. It's very hard on the back, comparing the back of a napkin estimate to what these gentlemen did with this estimate. No argument. And, and uh, I mean, last fall, I think we complimented you on, on going through the extra step, hiring the architect, putting together that space to help us get a better handle on this. Right. Where I'm trying to get to from a process standpoint is if we're still going to be off by 50% or more, what, what do we change about the process to get a better handle earlier? I mean, it, um, and, and again, I know that's not Riverfield specific. I don't mean to, to believe Yeah, it's that a big much, general question. But i um, um, trying to get my arms around, because there is a certain sticker shock. Right. And we spent... Uh, and I think that there were a lot of detailed questions asked by this. I know it, it, uh, we had the, technically because of expand the election, we had four different selectmen up here. We had uh, <laughs> Mr. Walsh, Ms. Stenick uh, at one hand, and then Mr. Walsh and Ms. McCarthy Vahey and myself at, at another. So that's a, a lot of different viewpoints Correct. going through. And I remember uh, questions and, and uh, sending you back for more information, and you guys did a great job of coming back with that additional information. So I'm trying to look back at that and say, how do we go from there to here? With all that work, with all the work you did, with all the prep work that was put together, I thought that was good work. I don't mean, I'm, I don't, this is not about being critical, it's about looking at the process and saying, how do we plan better? How do we kind of, what, uh, is, and, and, and again, I don't mean to belabor it here, this is more about Riverfield than that, but I guess I'd, I'd ask you to look back at that with 2020 hindsight, knowing what you know now, how do we do a better job on that? Hey, how, how do you throw another factor on what we're bringing forward to you? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, always, always questions about contingency. That's a, that's a, an, a question that's brought up every time. Um, different numbers are bantied about. The numbers that were on that preliminary estimate might have been a little bit smaller than you're seeing here. It, and you do get to, it does drive some of that delta, but well, it's the, I understand what yeah, you're asking. It's the dramatic big numbers. It's the, we went from uh, renovating uh, 1,500 square feet to renovating 35,000 square feet. We went from adding 11,000 square feet of new construction, adding, so in one case we're going up almost 20 times, in the other case we're going up three times. Uh, those are big differences. That's not, we're off 25 percent. Those are big number differences. Mm, right, and, and not to challenge what uh, George and Ken did, that's their analysis of another's architect's plan without having a direct discussion, so I don't know exactly if that we're renovation about, number that they're seeing is correct, if, but that's their evaluation yeah, of what if, they saw. So. If I could ask, if we're about to hear a request for $15 million, if somebody could have a direct discussion, that would be good. Uh, obviously, sure. I don't expect that to be done now, but it would seem that would be a step that we could go through to understand that, because I'm sure that other bodies might ask the same question. Sure. I'd like to point out a couple of things here. Um, you know, with the, you're, it's, it's difficult when you're looking at a chart on one hand and a plan on the other hand. Mm -hmm. Uh, so when you're looking at the 6 to 16, for instance, 
I mean, that sticks out in my mind too. So here's a classroom. It's now uh, language arts. It's filled with offices, instructional improvement, math improvement offices. Here's another classroom. The uh, health suite needed to go into a classroom. Uh, you know, psychology and social work needed to go into classrooms. So you lost classrooms based on the ed spec for spaces that weren't in the original plan that was developed prior to our, our uh, involvement. So that's where you've got to replace those now because those spaces weren't in that other plan. Okay. That's a reasonable point. Yeah. And, and, and again, it's not, it's, I'm trying to get back to uh, the functional thing should have been there. We should have known we needed health, better health setup. We should have known we needed uh, the, a music suite. I mean, that, that's a functional issue. You may divide right. that in three rooms. Which, you may you yeah. may make that 2,000 square feet instead of 500 square feet. But functionally, that should have been part of the original. The original and I can't speak to that because we doing. weren't involved. You know, all I can say is that when we we developed this program to be as efficient as possible to deal with the ed spec requirements, that's what happened to those classrooms. We had to take up some of that space. And that's why there's more classrooms than the original, because those spaces weren't accounted for in that other plan. Okay. And I guess the, the and again, this is probably a question you can't answer either, but uh, when I look at it, something like Osborne Hill, we went and, and added classrooms on Osborne Hill, and then um, and Sherman, and then went back and expanded the core facilities to match up to the classrooms. Uh, we did those classrooms with pods. Um, what is it that keeps Again, it's just the size. If we needed it to replace the portables, why couldn't we do that with a pod and, and uh, do some re renovation in, in addition with that? Did we explore that option? We, we, we explored keeping the pod. You may want to yes. move up. We not, not that pod. I'm no. talking about the pods like uh, Sherman or Osmond Hill. Did you have a chance to review those? Okay. We did Mr. that Cohen, one. If you, if you could define who we is since the architect said they didn't. Uh, we would be central office and the pre-construction design. Uh, we use someone called Phil Cerrone, yeah. who's in town and um, knows a lot of the elementary schools and actually did work with Howard Zwickler before me on additions to all those. Uh, we did ask him that. We told him that the annex building was well received. Uh, they went in quickly without just, much disruption. Just to put this in perspective, the annex buildings were annex about a million and a half dollars uh, correct. and two million dollars for each one, uh, which included classrooms and bathrooms and air conditioning. Correct. So that was a fairly cost-effective addition. Yep. We asked him to look at this site, and the site is very tight uh, to do an annex building. Um, he would have had to have gone into the field area and talk with Park and Rec about redesigning the field to fit a, uh, a portable structure like that. So we looked at that as an option um, and then dismissed and what it would, when we... What, what would that have cost or why did we decide not to do that? It was in the $2 million range, but it was um, with no field work and cost and changes to the field. It would have dramatically affected the field in the back. Uh, foundation work for that and getting utilities and everything out there. So we dismissed that um, plan when we talked with him. Yeah, well, dismissing that when we're down around 11 million is different than dismissing it when we're up around 17 million. 15. Money. <laughs> yes, and again, we worked with Phil Cerrone, who was about $7,200. Just, just to address that, Mr. Quinn, when you value engineered it down from 17, but when it came up at 17, that might have been something worth looking at to see if we could have value engineered more than just the 2 million out of it. But I do appreciate your efforts. Yes. Well, we may need to value engineer the mural here. <laughs> That's how I felt when I heard the 17 million. Well, I think I've said also in the past, Mike, uh, last two years, uh, one of the things the Board of Ed doesn't budget for is uh, monies to hire architects and engineers. Our budget is about 75,000 for consultants. We do anywhere from 20 to 30 projects we estimate for our budget. So if you do the numbers um, to hire an architectural engineering team to come in and do a pre-design or schematic design and an estimate that we can present that's hard and fast and won't change, um, 75000 isn't going to do it times 21 projects. Yep. No argument. And again, no, you, I, I, you need closer Mr. to 30000 I complimented the stuff. approach last fall. I thought that was yep. a, a big improvement over what we've done. I'm just, it's, it's uh, forgive me, it's sticker shock over where we mm -hmm. were and, and where we are. So I, I'm, um, uh, just trying to get through that. 
So we haven't gone back and looked at the pod versus bricks and mortar given the new cost. Uh, the building committee hasn't, but you know we did preliminarily last year. And did, did you guys talk? Uh, um, we talked about the pod, yeah. but I knew that they had looked at it with uh, Sharon. Yes, Sharon. Uh, but we also were facing not only the reluctance of of trying to do it there, but also the hundred year flood line that was out in the back. That's beyond the parks and recreation. Uh, so we we're very cognizant of that also. Uh, but we did not go forward and look at how we could squeeze it in. Because it is a squeeze. I mean, there is no room in that place. If you're going to keep the outdoor space for the kids to have recreation also. Yeah. Yeah. And just And again, I'm reacting to 15 million. I know you are. It, it, um, and looking for opportunities around that. Um, I tell you what we can do, because I, I think we, we can go around in circles. Maybe if we sat with Sarone, okay, and with you guys, and came out with a, a, a tighter explanation of what the variances are. And again, if the issue is it's going to impact Parks and Rec before we spend $15 million, I guess I'd like to talk to Parks and Rec and see what their objections are, if, if there's something we can do to make that work. Uh, 15 million. Uh, we can build ball fields for a lot less than $15 million. Yes. But anyway. Two, two follow-ups. One of the things you said was that, or excuse me, Mr. Cullen, um, that the pod would need to be somewhere else. And I think one of the questions I have is there's the Riverfield pod, which is its own unique pod. So I'll use Annex Building, which is similar to Sherman and Osmer Hill. That the annex building um, would need to be somewhere in the back as opposed to currently you, in other words that was keeping the current riverfield pod in place and then adding an annex building to replace the portables was what you talked about with mr yes Cerrone. yes and one of the biggest things we look at is security and safety when we put an annex building on an elementary site because the children do run back and forth the annex building is really general classrooms when the children need to go to cafeteria and eat, they need to go to gym, they need to go to music or art, they have to come into the main building. So we certainly want to place that in a spot on the site uh, where it's conducive to a, a set of doors uh, that gets you right into the main entrance of the school, whether it's the middle of it. You really don't want to put it way on the end, have it be 67 feet away, and the kids are running to a door that's not used that much to get into the main part of the school. You try and put it in a location where they're going to be able to get in and out quickly. We normally try and do a canopy over it. We've worked very hard with the fire department because the canopies can't touch the buildings. There's some code restrictions, but we want it covered so they're running in and out under a covered area. So based on all of that, the best location for the annex building was going to be somewhere like here or here, which you can see goes way into the field. So related to the field and the flood line, what can you talk to us? We, I meant to ask about that earlier, and we haven't really heard about that. What's, what are the issues on the site? The dark line that you see on the board is the 100-year flood plain. Uh, we're not allowed to build structure above grade there because it will impinge on the flood plain. So uh, again, not knowing what shape the annex is that you're referring to, is it would be very awkward and difficult to construct a freestanding structure to the west side of this, north being on this side, uh, that's not going to impinge on the flood plain or provide access around that annex for safety and access for fire department vehicles, security, that kind of thing. Uh, and our, again, our 2B scheme had an addition which came across like this, uh, and it was deemed too intrusive on the site work. All of this area back here. Could you, and again, just to help us understand, when you say it was deemed too intrusive, can you tell us by who and why it was well, deemed Well, in discussions with the building committee and neighbors uh, and the, during the evolution of the process of how scheme four was selected, uh, there has been a lot of discussion uh, over various approaches. This area of land here, you can see those very tight contour lines. Uh, historically, we believe this is all filled. So to build on that fill area would cause a whole different problem. I mean, we suspected that 
uh, this being a fill area, we're going to do geotechnical exploration if we advance the design process to make sure all our foundations are good. But we think if we had to build in this area, it would involve probably removing most of the soil there and recompacting it or having deep footings. Um, so again, keeping, and this is a paved play area, by the way, between, this is where the portables currently are, this pavement is hard surface recreation space for the kids. Uh, and we would have lost all of that. And it would have to be replaced somewhere. And again, you can't go beyond that line uh, to, to, to do that. When you say we can't build in the 100 year flood, how did we add the pod at Sherman? I don't know anything about Sherman. I can't tell you. I don't, okay. I don't know if there was a floodplain restriction. If, if, somebody, if somebody can verify that and explain how we added the pod at Sherman, how do we do that? No, no, no. Uh, I'm curious just because we seem to have done that. Okay. So I'm just done. Uh, Sherman's annex was a difficult project. Um, the flood zone is much higher. You know, if anyone that drives to Sherman can see that the annex building is almost four feet higher than the school. Um, that's to meet the flood zone. It could not be connected to the school, it couldn't touch the school, existing school. That's the same issue with Osborne or, Hill, though. Or you had to bring Sherman School up to meet the level of the flood zone. Correct. So that's but why we couldn't connect it. The gentleman said something different. I did. Yeah. I'm just trying and I'm just trying to reconcile the two, please. I, I'm, I'm just I'll, I'll expand on the on the different. The annex is a standalone building. There was no floodplain um, incursion from that project on the main building on Sherman proper. Okay. So if we did a pod here if it, it was elevated, then you were saying it would be allowed also. Right. You're getting back into the 50% renovation rule, mm -hmm. the FEMA cap that we had on phase two. Yeah. Um, because the pod, the, the, the annex itself could have driven, if fully connected to the main building, could have driven a lot of uh, upgrades to the existing building because we're violating FEMA cap. And FEMA was one issue. When we did Osborne Hill, the reason we didn't connect that was the same. It would have driven upgrades in the building would have dramatically increased the cost, if I remember correctly. Correct. We are connecting this. We are doing a lot of renovation. How much of this cost is driven by code upgrades? Uh, essentially, we're adding sprinklers to the building which is a code requirement for, mm -hmm. for this type of construction, uh, which is something that we would normally do. We're make, uh, making But you're upgrades. adding those to the entire building? Well you, well, you would sprinkle the entire building, yes. Okay. Are yes. there any other code upgrades besides the sprinkler system? Uh, we're going to update and modernize the uh, fire alarm systems. Throughout, because, throughout the entire building? Throughout the building, yes. Okay. Uh, and we're, <coughs> we're, ADAs. we're getting to the renovation of the remaining bathrooms to make them ADA compliant. Okay, and that's, we're in staff areas. That's why they, the boys and girls gang toilets and three staff toilets were yes. added in it. Yes, sir. What is the cost of all of that? Oh, jeez. For just for those specific items? Well, for any of the code upgrades, which is what my original question I, was. I, I can't put a dollar sum to can, it. Not, not right now, and I, I appreciate I can that. Break it out can, in the can somebody give us that number? Because one of so. the reasons we are told that we didn't add, we added the pod at Osborne Hill and didn't connect it was the cost of code upgrades throughout throughout Osborne Hill and just trying to find out and, and what drove that decision versus what's driving this decision uh, I can break out we can do an estimate and summarize the code aspects for you if you could sure okay. thank you okay. back to the code piece our doors classroom doors part of the code upgrades that are included in here? We did a feasibility study prior to going to this effort where we inspected the building. And it seems like most of the door hardware has been updated. They're all three feet wide. They have the clearances for the push poles. They have the lever handles on the sets. So whatever minor issues that haven't been addressed will be taken care of. Thank you. Could I go back to one of Mr. Tetro's earlier questions that pertains to this. I just want to make sure I understand the very basic concept of this document. The the net new classrooms, did I hear that number is nine? 
we're going to have nine new nine more classrooms in this finished product than we do today everything included pods portables etc you're losing four existing classrooms one two three four plus the seven in the pot that you're being torn down that's 11. that's 11. so out of that 16 five are upgrades additional space to replace what used to be in the pots i thought i heard the number nine before uh well that was before we realized we were losing existing interior spaces so right now there's kindergarten here with this is going to become the new computer lab the reason the computer lab is moving out it's right in the media center so one kindergarten becomes your computer lab this kindergarten is becoming additional support spaces this first grade class is becoming four spaces so you're losing one two three and there's an existing classroom here the existing office suite is basically this big so we're ex taking one classroom out of there including and then health clinics in there yeah okay let me ask the question another way because I, I i understand all that if i'm looking at this list and i start with the six new classrooms against the 16 new classrooms and, and i take that list right down to the social to the social elt room um line there's a variance of 16 between those two columns okay you've got 10 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1 etc the the difference in just numbers is 16. do you see what i'm saying here no, no. Uh, uh, let me show you. Yeah, so I, I think I'm just missing something. You've got 16, so that's a 10, right? Well, a 10 difference. Yeah. 12, 14, 15, 16. So from here to here, you're going from whatever number this is to whatever number that is, but the difference is 16. So that's what I'm trying to understand. And of these 16 incremental spaces, how many are classrooms? What is the net net? addition to teaching rooms well the ot pt room is a teaching room does that make better sense asking it that way uh well we need to re-break down this comparison it's a bit awkward to be honest with you yeah i mean i'm having trouble reconciling the two sides of the ledger oh yeah i, I wasn't even looking at those the, the music and computer labs i was just i, I think I, it would yeah. be helpful to to yep. revise this chart right. to be more specific to what was in the original yeah. spec. Yeah, Ken, I think that would be helpful. I, I think that's what you need. I'm just hard. I, I, I'm just trying to bridge one to the other, and it's right. just a little difficult. I, mean, I think we, yeah. we just kind of did some gross sort of areas that show cost yeah. differences. Right. But, but when you look at, for instance, this one sticks out, the six, the sixteen. Mm -hmm. It's not really. You're not adding ten more classrooms right. to the program. Understood. That was there. You're using classrooms to fill that up, so I think right. we could reissue this uh, and break it down more clearly. For you. Yeah, some helpful. some types of bridge analysis, to, just to getting us from A to B, would, yeah. would be very helpful. And my next question is, if we go back to um, the presentation that Mr. Tetro talked about at the Board of Selectmen, the eleven million dollar presentation, and this may not be a question for you, it might be for one of, one of the other guys over here. Um, was that eleven million dollar presentation most comparable to this list of pre ed spec yes, rooms or and, 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 and does that relatively equate to what is it two B or whatever it was? Scheme two B? What I'm trying to understand is what was presented. You know, was what was presented back in a year ago or so? roughly 11 million dollars with the data points you had i get all of that was that roughly equivalent to scheme b no, or no, roughly no. equivalent to this list over here that list. okay it it that, was that roughly right there. that's what that was list was made from okay so so what that tells me is that fundamentally the answer to mike's question even though it conflicts with one of your responses about the removing of the pod and doing it that way not adding a ton of cost well, they're fundamentally different projects. Right. But we also saw that some of the assumption that may have been made at that time didn't incorporate some of the other issues, such as the floodplain, such as um, the soil that where they put it didn't right. make any sense because it could be filled. Right. There's a whole series of things that came out of that very quick study, I get my guess is, right. that didn't accommodate right. the final ed spec and some of the site issues yeah. that would be required to do that. Right. So I think, again, right. if we 
can compare, if we can modify this chart so it's very clear about what those differences right. are, I think that would answer that, would, that question. It would, it, the other it thing would. is I just wanted to point out that we're in a different time now. Annex buildings that you have to walk outside to get to, security is an issue. And so that needs to be taken into account. Those are fair well, points. And my question is not to be critical of the numbers associated with today's project, which is equating to the current ed specs because right. you you could look at that with a critical eye and say wow that's dramatically different and now what now I understand why it's five or six million dollars more but conversely you could look at these very same two columns and say well geez on this column here for 11 million bucks I was getting 11,000 square feet or new and I was only touching 1500 of existing space right. over here it, it's roughly 68,000 so if you look at it just from those per perspectives you could say I'm, 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 I'm driving a lot more value over here right. for 16 or for 15 or 17 versus it looked like I might have been getting here for 11. So there's I two sides of the coin. That. I agree with that. I just don't know how to reconcile it. Right. So, yeah. And again, you know, not being involved in the earlier thing, I yeah. can only guess to what some of those assumptions were. Right. But what we can do is be very clear about the comparison and that, show that where, be the, helpful. where the, you know, head spec items yeah, from it, what the original to was. define that, if I if I might, because that's the same item I had down. I'd love to see that the ed spec priced out for Stratfield, for Riverfield, and for Sherman, so we can see what the costs were for that. That's um, that. Since we've got mm -hmm. one completed, one mostly completed, and see what what are the ed cost drivers from that standpoint. Uh, mm -hmm. And then my concern about the the security, and and let's be very frank, if we have security issues at Sherman and Osborne Hill, then we need those addressed. If, if, if the pods aren't going to do that, if we have a security item, we need that stuff addressed ASAP. Um, so if, you're, if, if part of the rationale for this is security and it's that important, then we need to make sure that we address it at our other schools too. We can't just do it here and say we'll get back to Osborne Hill and Sherman 10 years from now when it's, it's, oh. the, the spirit strikes us. So if security is the issue, then, then let's make sure that's a priority at our existing buildings as, as well as what we're doing here and let's not uh, cause any more issues. But uh, if I might. But in terms of breaking that up by ed spec, because uh, that's my concern is here is, is what is driving the cost? What is it on this ed spec? Because one of the questions is, um, and, and again, this is not a Riverfield question, but it's an ed spec question. How do we how do we develop ed specs? How do we know what the cost parameters we're putting? The building committee is doing their job. You have given more information, done more analysis early on than any building committee I've seen. So that's that's a compliment. The, the other side of that is that if you're being tasked with something, you can't possibly build for $11 million. You can't, then we need to get kind of a clear handle on what is driving the costs on this. So the Board of Ed knows going forward what those cost parameters are. And again, that feeds into our capital planning process. So we kind of know what's driving it from that standpoint. You guys, you guys are doing what we've asked and you're doing your job uh, in spades. So this is not, I don't mean to be because you've done it so well, that's allowed us to ask these questions, if, if that's not a backhanded compliment too much. Well, that sure is. <laughs> uh, but the, the, at some point from this side, you need to be able to see what the ed specs are driving at, and are all those ed spec components um, as critical as every other one? Let's, uh, security is obviously a very critical one, so we, we know that the security issues have got to be addressed. Are there other components within the ed spec that, that aren't as critical? Uh, can the Board of Ed then modify those to help us get, because um, you've done everything you can do by value engineering and meeting the spec. And what I hear coming out of this is uh, we want to know the, the dollar cost of code increase that came out of here uh, to meet with the uh, prior architect and do a better job uh, with his help getting the 11 million versus the 15 million and where the, the key drivers of those are. Uh, then look for the ed specs uh, in the classrooms, the bridge um, that we, you were looking for. Please, thank you. Okay, and then breaking out the ed spec dollar cost for Stratfield versus Riverfield. Yeah, that would be enough. I, Sherman might be too much of a different project, but Stratfield okay. and Riverfield might be helpful, um, again, to get a handle on What's That's what I have his follow-up so far. Now, Kristen, I know you had. And just to add on, actually, to what Selectman Kiley had proposed, rather than just the comparison to the pre-EdSpec study and the scheme study in terms of rooms, it would also be helpful to have 
What currently exists today to, to compare all three next to each other? Yeah, that, that I think will help us better translate. Here's what we analysis. have now. Yeah. Here's yes. what was proposed before, yeah. and here's what is being proposed now. And that I think it'll help me because as yeah. I'm listening to this, I'm thinking, well, wait, what's there now, and what are we doing, and what yep. were they thinking of doing? And Got to it, really yeah. spell out the formula yeah. would be helpful. One last quick one. Just one last quick one for me. And I, I know it's getting late, and I want to thank you guys and your, all of your teams for all your work. This is great. And did I hear earlier a mention of HVAC on the second floor of the new addition, or did I get that wrong? There will be air yeah, conditioning. Yes. Just mechanicals for H. The entire building will be air The entire building. New and existing. Right. Have and 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 I don't understand enough about HVAC to really ask the question right, but. Haven't we had issues in other buildings where there were HVAC units or other mechanicals on the second floor versus the first floor of a building? Burrs coming to mind? Or am I, am I getting something boiler. wrong? Boiler. Boiler it was the boilers that. that yeah, the boiler the rooms that had um, burr were, were placed on the second floor. That, that's so the not heating doing, system, not the HVAC system. So you're not so. proposing that here, no. nothing of that magnitude oh, on the God. second floor? No, no, no. Okay, that's what I thought I heard. Thank you. Over somebody's dead body. <laughs> not mine. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you. That's, I'm good. Thank Any you. other questions? No, sir. Just to comment, I mean, I think what you're hearing is that, well, I'll speak for myself. What I'm saying is I, I'm very cognizant of the fact that work needs to be done at the school and I'd like to see the right work done at the school and I also am very cognizant as are all of you that um, the fiscal issues will be pressing upon us and I think that frankly that this there will be continue to be some difficult questions and I, I don't want to go there now since we're so late but um, just looking at the reality of that I think we'll be continuing to have some conversations about that I, I understand that just so everybody understands we never designed an 11 million dollar addition or renovation that got out of hand we designed to the head specs a total 15 million okay no you're absolutely clear I think that, that uh, and frankly, because you've been so clear on that, it, it really focuses on the Ed Spec themselves and, and what the Board of Ed defined in terms of getting there. Uh, I don't think there's any question that given that spec, you did the best job you could with it, at least in my mind. I don't mean to. Uh, well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes. Uh, first Next up is the Board of Selectmen regular meeting dates for 2013. So moved. Uh, second. Second. All right. Uh, just for discussion purposes, I know I can't make the 16th, so I'll have to look at another one there. But I'm. Uh, I would suggest that we let approve this and let Jen sort that out. I'm fine with that. I, yeah. I, I think. There's already been a, an initial proposal for the following week, the 23rd, which which works better for me. I'm I'm not good on the 16th either, so that's fine. So I, I actually have a couple of comments about the calendar and would prefer that if we're able to amend it here, it then becomes our regular meeting schedule and we don't have to deal with special meetings and whatnot. So okay. I'll just give it a shot. Pre before making a motion, if I can just go through some of my comments. Um, I just want to note, as I did last year, the April 17th meeting, our second meeting is during the um, public school spring break time. So I'm just noting that. Um, I also, in looking at the July meeting, recognize that the, th the meeting on the 3rd comes right before a weekend where a, a holiday and then a potentially a weekend where people may go away. I was considering making a motion to move that meeting to June 26th, which would then. Um, July? The July 3rd meeting, moving it up to June 26th. And okay, keep going. again, I'm just, I'm not mm -hmm. making a motion, I'm just discussing. Mm -hmm. but potent, or to move it to the second, something that would, um, again, allow the public. I think, I think that's part of the issue, is people tend to go away. So, And then the other issue is uh, September 4th, Rosh Hashanah begins, I believe, at sundown, and I think we should. 
look at again moving that meeting again um, mm -hmm. uh, do we have to, uh, Jen do we have to pass this tonight yes uh, the town clerk requires this being passed in December so okay okay um, yeah, the, the, well, my the concern is if we start bumping too many. I'm not suggesting bumping the April meeting. I was simply noting it as mm -hmm. I did last year. Okay. Um, but I do, I think we ran into this at Thanksgiving. We passed a calendar last year mm -hmm. and recognized that the day before a holiday, so the 3rd of July and September 4th is really mm -hmm. just out of respect. Um, so if we move January 16th to a week later, if we move the 17th to a week later. I, I'm not suggesting moving the, the, the April meeting. I was just noting it. I actually. I think that's a good thought, though, because, um, you know, I don't don't know what my plans are for that week yet potentially right and bump the fourth to a week later yep bump the fourth to the 11th that would make perfect sense for september and that july 3rd is a wednesday right so you're thinking right. about monday the first tuesday the second do, do you want to just move that a day after like to the fifth well, my Assuming thought was or or eliminate it for now and say look if we need it schedule a special meeting for that we could do that that might I, be the better way of going what about this. doing it on what about the second and the only reason i hesitate is because well if, and, and partly why i suggested the week this before is, the second we're assuming the board of finance won't meet then which they traditionally don't that's correct. i don't remember i don't right. remember what their calendar yeah. said i don't remember either but i i would assume that they're not meeting that first tuesday the night before the holiday yeah i'm okay with moving it that tuesday I'm okay with just canceling that or taking it off the calendar for now. And if we need something, we can add it at a later date. The only reason I advocate for making the change is we could change the cancel, or excuse me, we can cancel the change meeting, but then it becomes a regular meeting. We don't have to deal with extra minutes. It, yep. Just logistically speaking. Uh, well, okay. Whatever works for you guys. Um, but so I, I think. Why don't you make your motion and then we can. Okay. Or something official right. to discuss. Are you proposing that which side of July 4th are you proposing to go to? The second or the The second. I because of the issue of I think people will go away for a long weekend. More people. Not everyone will, but again. Well, the holidays on a the holiday is on, on Thursday. a Thursday, so it's more likely to go away the Thursday, Friday. Yes, that's what I was thinking. So I don't know that. I'm just trying to make it. It's more it likely accessible. it's closer to that weekend. Okay. Right. Makes sense. So I will make a motion that we change the january 16th meeting to january 23rd uh -huh. that we move the july 3rd meeting to tuesday july 2nd uh -huh. and that we move the september 4th meeting to the following wednesday september 11th uh -huh. right, i'll second any further discussion no, I'm good with it, uh, and we'll just leave the school vacation week open for now and subject to whatever happens, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I haven't discussed it with my wife, so I don't know. So I'm in a similar situation. <laughs> I'm not. So I'm in Kylie. <laughs> 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 no, I could get in trouble for that comment, too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. Any, uh, uh, any further so. discussion at the, by the board? No. <laughs> no. Any comments from the public uh, back to the board are we ready to vote yeah all in favor aye, aye. Uh, and then we have budget meetings for calendar 2013 mm -hmm. board selectman joint public hearing uh, may I have a motion to accept so moved a second second uh, key date here is when we vote on the budget the other ones are our joint meetings uh, at night mr yeah. Bolito stopped in this afternoon okay uh discussed kind of what they were doing in terms of potential joint discussions not discussions do we add those public discussion sessions into our calendar or not mm. um and we we kind of came to the conclusion that we're ex officio members of the board of finance right, right. so okay. even if it's not a yes. for public discussion we can still comment and participate in those so we can join in on those we're not voting that night we don't um make sense so we can just go with their schedule and go with this. We don't have to overthink what we're doing here if that's okay with 
the both of you. That Agreed. Sounds great. I had reached out to Mr. Bolito and uh, just to he gave you full sure credit. They were <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm as I expressed to him, I'm very Good. comfortable with that. Just wanted to make sure okay. the comfort level was all around. So great. Absolutely. Um, any further discussion? Mm -hmm. so any comments from the public? Back to the board. So we're going to be voting on the budget on April Fool's Day. Yes. Okay. Just, just <laughs> okay. Bring your smile. All right. I will All right. be trying very hard to do that. Are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, next up, uh, we have a motion to accept tax collector refunds. So moved. A second. Second. Uh, any discussion? Yes. I believe there's oh. an amendment. There's one variance to a number on one page. The, the last uh, move to approve all but the final um, item on this list, which is 2010-02-84103 in the amount of $53.30. So we're limiting that out, and that will come back to us later? Yes. Yeah, it all needs right. to be correct. Uh, any dis uh, is there a mo is there a second to that motion? Second. Any discussion on the amendment? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 So the tax uh, refunds as amended are before us. So uh, any further discussion? Oh, sorry. We, we moved them right, so we're okay. We can vote. Jen, we moved those earlier, right? So we can vote from here. Ready to vote? Yep. Yep. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, okay. To hear and consider and act upon any communications, um, I don't think we have any at this point. Okay. Uh, and to hear and consider and act upon any other business that shall properly come before this meeting, I don't believe we have any at this point. Oh. I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you both. Great. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you.